I want to welcome you to session two of the Managing Cow-Calf Operations for Profit Conference. Tonight's title is called Bale Grazing and Profitable Cow Herd Management. My name is Becky Thompson and I'm the director of the Kentucky Beef Network. While we are disappointed that we're not together in person this evening, we do have some fantastic information that we're excited to bring you. Tonight's program is brought to you through funding by the Kentucky Agriculture Development Fund through the Kentucky Beef Network and our partner, the University of Kentucky Department of Agriculture Economics. We will be recording tonight's presentations and sharing the video links and slides at the conclusion of the series later this week. Before we get started, I would like to touch on a few Zoom housekeeping tips. The chat box at the bottom of your screen, you can submit chats uh, to our panelists and other attendees throughout the, the evening. If you do have a question for our, our presenters, we ask that you use the Q&A box at the bottom and we will reply back to you and answer live or we will reply directly back to you. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Kenny Burdine and Greg Hallett to begin our program. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Greg Hallich, Department of Agricultural Economics. Um, <clears throat> excuse me there. Um, I'm going to start off tonight uh, essentially doing a presentation on, on bale grazing. And um, probably a lot of you aren't familiar with bale grazing, so we'll kind of start with basics here. Uh, but trying to put it in relation to yesterday that there are a lot of advantages to bale grazing. Um, you can significantly, if not eliminate fertilizer use, at least on your pastures. Um, you can reduce your labor machinery costs, um, potentially, especially if you calve kind of in, in early or middle of winter when it can be muddy, uh, can even increase your, your weaning percentages. So there are a lot of benefits to it. We'll go through all of them. And again, we'll kind of start from the basics. So we will talk quite a bit this evening about the value of nutrients in terms of fertilizer value that are coming out of hay. So just kind of to summarize, we talked about this yesterday, what is the cost of hay? Uh, so again, if, if typically if you're buying it at least, and that, that's kind of how I put a value on it, somewhere in, at least here in central Kentucky, somewhere between probably $60 $80 a ton for, for decent quality hay is usually what I figure. So what is that potential nutrient value? And of course, it's going to depend on how we feed it out. Uh, but let's kind of start with the upper limit. And this may not be the absolute best we can do, but it's probably getting close. Um, we're in this situation, we're going to get about 75% of, of the value that starts in that hay back as fertilizer value uh, wherever we feed it. And so what I'm showing you there on the, on the far right hand side, that, that would be the nutrient value for the N, P, and K on a per ton basis. So again, um, if you think of a five by five bale, divide that roughly by two. If we add all that up, we've got right around $25. So if the value of our hay is $75, just an example, we're effectively getting one third of that back as, as fertilizer value um, if we're doing a good job of feeding it. So how do we do that? How do we reach kind of that top nutrient uh, value that we looked at there. So let's just kind of start with conventional ways that we feed and, and work back from there. So this is a picture kind of a, of a typical, what we call dry lot in Kentucky, uh, sacrifice area. And I would argue it's actually probably a really good one. Uh, this farm is, is good about feeding in different locations kind of through the winter. So they, they probably were only on the site maybe a month or so would have been my guess. Um, looks like they're scraping up the manure there so that at least they're, they're probably trying to utilize uh, what they have in that area, what they fed out. But I can look at this picture and, and, you know, and I can highlight there and hopefully you can see a little bit better now. Uh, but there's some broom sage growing up in that pasture. And again, it's not real distinct because they, they clip their pastures quite a few times, typically. And, and one of those will usually be kind of early September. So it's, it's been mowed back there. Um, we don't know for sure. It could just be lime, uh, but a lot of times it's a combination of lime and, and soil fertility. Uh, so there's a good chance that, that we're not doing a great job even in this situation. We'll look at the dynamics of, of dry lots and feeding pads and, and how much of those nutrients actually um, get, can if, if they're spread, actually make their way back to pasture later on. Here's a feeding pad. Um, it, you know, it looks like we have a little bit of erosion going on there. 
the cattle are walking around. Yeah, we can see some manure in the foreground here, but but most likely most of what's coming out the back end of those cattle are is probably within 100 feet of that feeding pad. It doesn't look like probably they're they're getting much use of that. What about here's a, a fairly new feeding pad put in just a couple of years ago at Kentucky State University. Um, what did it cost? Twelve thousand dollars. Now it's a university, so they they may have overbuilt it. They may have wanted the Cadillac version. Probably you or I could have built it for a few thousand less. Uh, but hopefully they got Cadillac results to to kind of show for it. So how effective was it? Uh, the next slide I'm going to show you essentially is is not quite at the end of the first year of of hay feeding, and it was it was kind of in mid February, if I remember correctly, uh, of that first winter. So. I'll let you be the judge, but let's just say Kentucky State University was not happy with, with the results. They thought it was going to be a whole lot better than what we're looking at. What are some other options? Um, the last couple of years, we've been hearing about uh, compost embedded pack barns, uh, potentially for use for beef cattle. Now, these have been around with dairies, and I'd argue you know, they're a whole lot more cost effective with, with something like that with a high value product. Um, where, where you're going to have animals essentially that you want to come in all the time. Um, but that said, they do a wonderful job with beef cattle um, in terms of preventing the problems that we typically see. So that the cattle are in here all winter time, so they're not coming back and forth from pasture to here like they would say with a feeding pad. So they're not kind of causing problems with, with mud. Um, and then even better, all the nutrients that are coming out of the back end of these cattle are, are getting incorporated into that sawdust that you see there. And so we're doing a great job of essentially locking those nutrients up until we, we spread this, which will probably be every one to two years. Um, all that said, there's just one small problem with all of it, and, and that's that they're expensive. Uh, and for a, a beef cattle cow calf type farm, they're never going to pencil out, even if it's fully cost shared. The, the yearly operating costs, including your labor and machinery costs, are just not going to make it work. And with the exception of if you can get the sawdust for nearly free, uh, essentially just whatever it costs to deliver it, there might be a chance there, but otherwise they're not going to pencil out, even if it's fully cost shared. Uh, if you're interested, if you're thinking about doing this, please contact me. I've got some detailed analysis on it with various kind of scenarios, kind of like what I did yesterday, that you can choose which one is, is most applicable and, and you can make your own decision. What about unrolling hay? We do this quite a bit in Kentucky. Um, I mentioned I, I did my graduate work in Virginia. Uh, they loved unrolling hay in that Bridge and Valley um, section of Virginia. So unrolling, actually, I, I really like unrolling. And if, if the choice is between a dry lot feeding pad and, and unrolling, I'll, I would pick unrolling every time. There's, there's, only, there's a couple of things I don't like about unrolling though. And the first one is, if you want to keep your waste to a, a reasonable level, you're going to be out there every day or, or every second day is what people that, that do this tell me. And if you go beyond that, the, the waste increases exponentially. So you're out there a lot, your, your labor and machinery costs are going to be a lot higher than, than they would say with bale grazing um, or even other conventional feeding methods. Um, and invariably, you're going to be out there then in some conditions when it's really wet. And you know, some wet conditions with, with a heavy tractor, you're going to do a lot of compaction, probably more compaction than the cattle are going to do all winter time. Um, so, but again, if the only choice between unrolling or say a feed pad or a dry lot, yeah, I would, I would take unrolling hay. That gets us to bale grazing. That's what we're going to focus on the rest of my presentation. Um, so think of this as, as another option to, um, to feed in the wintertime. And it's one that, I, that we've actually been using for about 10 years on that farm in Woodford County. So here is kind of a, di a bird's eye diagrammatic view of, of what it looks like. Um, and so wherever you're storing your hay, usually whether that's in the barn, under tarps, et cetera, usually late fall, early winter, you'll take that out. And you don't have to do all of it one time, but I, I typically like to say at least do a third at one time just to get efficiencies of, of moving a, a bunch of hay at one time versus doing it piecemeal. So get it out of storage, put it out at, at least in the part of your pastures, kind of checkerboard fashion like this. You're going to always want to start from your water source. So I've got that over on the right hand side. And then just like with the rotational grazing, you're going to put up temporary fences, um, poly tape, poly wire. And in this case, I've, I've got three bales that the cattle are going to have access to at the time. Um, they would go through that and on some farms that might be just a day on other farms that might be a week. It just depends on the number of cows, the size of the, the bales, et cetera. Um, 
you're done there, you, you move to the next bales and you just kind of, again, gradually work through that pasture until you're done. And, and hopefully you can have two or at least two or three more pastures just kind of like this that you can do the same thing with. Um, show you in, in kind of picture view right here. This is on one of the farms I've been working with. Uh, this was kind of mid-January, if I remember correctly, this year. Uh, so the arrows are point, pointing at the cross fence that was just put up, the cattle were just moved. Uh, probably 10 minutes before I took this picture. Uh, the water source is actually a little bit to the right off the screen. You can't see it, but they're coming back and forth uh, to the water source over there. Um, another thing you can't really see here is there's a, a semi-permanent cross fence where I've got that dotted line. This is a pretty big pasture, probably 15 acres or so. Um, and what I found is, is on good sized pastures, if you're going to be on there for, say, a couple weeks or longer, it sometimes makes sense to do one kind of semi-permanent cross fence to, to break it in half. That way the cross fences, the ones with the arrows that that's pointed at, the length of that cross fence essentially is going to only be half the length as it, as it would otherwise. So it again cuts down on your labor. Um, all the farms that I've been working with here in Kentucky use hay rings. Um, it's very easy to do. You just flip them up from where they're at in the last bale, roll them to the next one. If, if you do your planning correctly, you'll only be moving about 50 to 100 feet at a time. Then when you get there, you just flip it back down into place. I like to think there are four main requirements to bale grazing. Um, the first one, and, and this is really get, to get the full benefits out of reduced labor and equipment costs, but that's to, to do that well, you, you're really gonna have to kind of plan it out. And, and what I like to say, number one related to that is, is don't put hay out piecemeal, two, you know, two bales at a time or even just one wagon load at a time put out a bunch at one time, there, there are big efficiencies in doing that. We'll look at that later on in detail. If you're gonna use hay rings, obviously you need the strength to roll and flip those hay rings. Now that said, I do know, do know farmers that do not use hay rings. Uh, I'm not working with any of them. I, I did work, I, there's one farm that I've worked with that tried it a little bit and they just, as you would think, they had more hay waste so they didn't do it very long. Uh, the ones that I do it, that do it that I know do it well, uh, what they tell me is you only want to give them access to enough hay for at most two days. So just, just kind of like unrolling hay, if you give them more than that, they will start wasting um, exponentially more very quickly. Number three, um, and this should also be obvious, you, you need cattle that are very well trained electric fencing. So if you're doing rotational grazing right now, you, you know, your cattle are trained. If you aren't, you're going to want to train them before you put them out with, say, 20 or 30 bales in a pasture. Number four is not a necessity, but it, it helps. Um, so the, the better or the stronger that your sod is, um, the more impact it will take without be becoming damaged. And we'll look at lots of pictures kind of related to this. So uh, not an absolute necessity, but, but generally you want a, a fairly healthy sod if you're gonna bale graze on it. Think of your hay as potential nutrients, because that's what it is. Uh, out of every bale of hay, roughly 80, 90% of those actual nutrients are gonna end up coming out the back end of your, your cattle. Uh, how you, how and where you actually feed that or where they dump it is, is going to determine how much of that you really get back in terms of fertilizer value. So think of that before, that's, that's the potential nutrients, and then the next slide will be after. And if you do your job well, if you plan and execute well, you can have something that looks just like that. It's, you know, really good nutrient distribution, um, and that's what we're aiming for. It's more than I was going to achieve it, but that's kind of the goal. How much nutrients are we actually going to get on a per acre basis? So I'm going to show you a few examples here. It's obviously going to depend on, on how much hay you feed per acre. So we'll look at three different densities, uh, what I'm calling low, medium, and high. And we're going to first start looking just at the N, P, and K values, and we'll, we'll talk about some other additional benefits that we're getting. So let's start with the, the high um, density, six tons the acre. Uh, just for context, you know, two five by five bales are, are going to be roughly a ton. So six tons the acre would be roughly 12 five by five bales on a per acre base. So about 69 yards by 69 yards would be an acre. So there are two reasons why I, I do not recommend feeding anything close to these densities in Kentucky. Um, <clears throat> the first one just is that it, unless you have perfect conditions, unless it's, it's either very dry or frozen, and neither of those conditions generally occur for very long in Kentucky during our winters. Um, and if either of those occur while you're feeding at densities like that, you will have a potentially really bad pugging damage. So 
in the, the high plains, so the Dakotas, Alberta, Saskatchewan, where bale grazing really originated, they can bale graze at higher densities than that, but their ground is frozen over for six or seven months. So they don't have to worry about the pugging issues. We do down here, so we have to adapt. Um, the other reason I don't like feeding those densities is just look at the, the nutrient values there in units. So we've got a little over 100 units of nitrogen. So that would be like 220 pounds of urea roughly. We've got almost 240 units of, of potassium. Uh, that would be well over 300 pounds of potash on a per acre basis. We just typically don't need anything close to that in, in pasture situations. In fact, put, put a little more nitrogen in there, we can, we can grow pretty good corn silage um, with this type of, of nutrient uh, density. So we, we really don't need them and, and we don't want to destroy our pastures in the process. So we want to move down from that. We can look at the four ton level. We're still getting really good nutrient uh, levels at, at that density. But again, unless things are kind of perfect and unless we have well-drained soils, we still have the potential to do fairly, you know, a, a fair amount of plugging damage. I do know farms that, that do at this level and do fine, but you really have to have really good management. And you, you generally have to have fairly well-drained cells to, to not run into those problems of plugging. So what I would say is be very careful if you feed at those densities. And I'd rather have you feed at that lowest one or even a little bit lower than that, maybe one to two tons to the acre. So even there, we're getting a, a good boost of, of fertility, 35 units of nitrogen, so about 80 uh, pounds of urea. Uh, and we're still getting a lot of potassium. Uh, 80 units would be about 120 um, pounds of potash. So again, for pasture situations, we're, we're still getting a, a good uh, dose of fertilizer and that's in even that low end situation. So that's where I'd like to see people feed. And that's why I encourage them to feed it at say one to two tons to the acre. Now that said, that's just raw N, P, and K, and we're getting some additional benefits with bale grazing. One is organic matter. So if you're putting commercial fertilizer down, you're not getting any organic matter in that process. It's, you're just getting the chemical M, P, and K. Um, so we're getting additional benefit there. It's hard to quantify just long-term. I think that's really important. That's gonna be a, a big benefit. We're also getting quite a few micronutrients. For instance, we're getting sulfur, we're getting calcium, magnesium, et cetera, that we're not necessarily getting in our, our main three types of fertilizer. So there are a lot of additional benefits that are, are kind of hard to quantify. Uh, but they're important nonetheless, and, and they may be long run as important as just the raw N, P, and K. Don't know for sure. Now, this is the question that I get asked, or the concern that most farmers have when they're kind of introduced to bale grazing. Their eyes get big, and, they, and they're, they're worried that what? That, that this might destroy their pastures. Um, and I will say this, if, if you don't plan and you don't execute well, you can do a lot of damage to your pastures, and we'll look at a few pictures here. This is um, the, the latest farm that I started working with. It's in Anderson County. So they started bale grazing this winter. And let me explain the situation just to understand why they, they fed it at essentially close to twice the density that I really want them to. So they end up feeding just under four tons the acre of hay. And again, we really want to get them to feed it about two tons or want him to get to feed it at about two tons the acre. Now he has a fair amount of rental ground that's in pasture. And so in the wintertime, he consolidates everything, brings him back to his home farm. And so in other words, during the wintertime, at least now in the future, he, he might be able to change this. But this winter, he, he essentially has a pretty high stocking rate on the home farm. Uh, in other words, he doesn't have enough pasture acres to, to really make the bale grazing work at lower densities uh, if he's going to feed a good chunk in the winter. He actually has a feed pad. That's where he's been feeding. It's just about 100 yards to the right of the picture. And he did feed there part of the winter, but he wanted to feed at least two months um, with bale grazing. So to do that, the only way it would work on the home farm is if he fed roughly what we're looking at, something close to four tons the acre. So everything was, was okay. I mean, there's a little bit more plugging damage than I, than I wanted to see the first few weeks, but then he got about two and a half inches of rain one night. Um, so, you know, got a text from, him, I think the next morning and said, yeah, this, this will know how this is gonna work here real quick. And so over the next four days, and I'll, I will highlight the area that the cattle were on that they were feeding in during that, that time period. And it's that area that got, you can see is, is muddy and churned up. So that area, it wasn't huge, maybe a, a tenth of an acre. Uh, but the worst damage I've ever seen with any, any of the farms that I've been working with by, by far. Uh, to make matters worse, just before that happened, um, his, his cows start going to heat. And so 
um, they were just walking around a lot more than they normally would. So when it was wet, they, they were causing even more damage um, based on that. So a number of things kind of hit him. The, the third thing is his soils are not what I would call well-drained. Um, they have a fair amount of clay in them. So they're, they're not terribly drained, but they're definitely not well-drained somewhere in between. So the combination of all those factors produced a, whole, a, a lot more pugging than I was comfortable seeing. He was okay with it. Um, and again, he learned here, I think, and, and I think we'll make some changes next year and adapt. This is actually in the same county in Anderson County, different farm, uh, similar soils, clay soils, actually like an Eden Shale type soil. And what you're looking at is pretty typical average slope on his farm, pretty much the whole, you know, not the whole farm, but two thirds of the farm looks about like that. So even more challenging uh, geographically than the, the first farm, but he fed at a lower density. Still didn't, wasn't quite at that two tons acre, but he was close. Um, so yes, he had a fair amount of damage, particularly around the rings, because it, it got real wet in there when it did get wet, just because of the soil type. Uh, but it wasn't bad. This is mid-April after it greened up after the bale grazing, and he does a really good job of, of seeding just the areas right around the bales, what I call the impact zone. We'll look at that later. Um, so he, he did, he really helped mitigate that. Um, but in general, this is not bad. Not great, uh, but not bad given, given the conditions of his farm. By the way, the reason he, he fed a little bit higher, same reason as first farm, he also has some rental ground, not as much, um, but when he brought him back here to, to bail graze as long as he wanted to, he had to essentially feed a little higher density. This is what I like to see um, both in, in tonnage uh, of hay per acre and also it's, this is on what I call well-drained soils. Um, so they have um, more going for them here to, to mitigate the pugging. Now that said, it should be obvious where the cattle just came off. Those were the, where the two last bales were. They got about an inch and a quarter of rain, uh, maybe two days before I took this picture and they were just moved when I took the picture to the next section of pasture and bales. Uh, but this is pretty typical. If you get an inch or so of rain where the cattle are for the next day or two after that, that's typically what it's going to look like. Not terrible pugging, but you know they're going to make a little bit of mud there. By the way, um, you typically won't get that much hay waste. This is the farm that did experiment without using hay rings. And so what you see right here is, is during that, I don't know, two or three weeks that they're experimenting. And again, they had a little bit more hay waste than they really wanted to. So they end up going back to uh, bale rings. Now that said, there's a little bit of pugging here, but if we look just to the left of, of what we just looked at there, the area that they were also on, but we, we didn't have the bales, that's essentially what it looks like. There was some grass, they grazed that down, and you can see we still got good manure distribution in that area, uh, but essentially no real pugging there. That will come back beautifully that next spring. And if everything goes right, and it did in this situation, it was dry uh, for the two or three weeks that, that you can see that they were feeding in this picture. They're on the last four bales right now. Uh, everything went right and you know no pugging whatsoever. But obviously here in Kentucky and probably all the upper south, things are, are, aren't going to always go right. You know, maybe two, three weeks at a time, but that's about it. You, you've got to expect wet conditions um, and you've got to essentially bail graze so that when you get to those conditions, you won't have a disaster. This is a, a drone photo. It's, it's actually from Virginia and it's, um, there's NRCS um, agronomist, J.B. Daniel, that became interested in bail grazing last year. He knew I was doing some of this in Kentucky and working with other farmers. Um, so he, we, we basically set up a Zoom meeting, kind of like what you're looking at right now, uh, a little more applied probably what we're looking at here, but he basically wanted to know how, how do I bail graze and, and how can I do this with someone here in Virginia and make it work. So we kind of went over some strategies to do that. To his credit, he found a farm this fall to work with and you, you kind of see the fruits of his labor. Um, I thought, and I saw a lot of close-up shots and he did an excellent job working with his farm. Now you, you might not see it, but I can look even at this far out level and I can see a couple spots where visually I can see it was wet when, when they were fed and I'll, I'll kind of highlight those. And, and now I will zoom in on the one on the left. So you can see that a little clear now and, and hopefully it should be more obvious the the rings that, that were being fed when it got wet. And again, that's typically what you're gonna see. If it's wet, you'll see the plugging right around where, where the ring was, what I call the impact zone where the hooves are. Uh, you also get a lot of fertility there. So in the short run, that's where the damage will be. 
long run, that actually will be the best, uh, the most fertile pasture or fertile ground in your pasture. Well, and when, when I say long run, it depends on, on what you do to mitigate that. But if you recede at the end of that winter time, that long run could be two, three years out. That will be some of the best pasture that you have uh, compared to everything else. By the way, I look at this, I've not been there on the ground, but just the other pictures I've seen, I think he has a fair amount of broom sedge. You can kind of see the clumpy growth there. The cow obviously didn't eat it. So I'm guessing that, that there's a fair amount of broom sedge there. So this, these pastures probably could use a lot of fertility is my, my gut feeling. This is actually on, on that farm that Kenny and I have bailed raised for about 10 years now. And this is, this is almost pretty typical of what it will look like at the end of, of the winter time. So this is a place that we, a bale that we fed out that winter, probably in, in January, maybe early February. And this is middle April when I took this picture. And this is typically what you see right in the middle, they will usually be grass. That's where the bale was sitting. Um, and then on the outside of that, will be where most of the hay residue is, the, the hay that they pulled out and dropped and, and got wasted. Um, so, you know, that's what it'll typically look like in, in spring. We usually will seed it down just with a hand broadcaster in just one or two hours, the whole farm, and we'll be done with. And I know people that don't do it, and it'll just take maybe another year, year and a half for, for it to essentially heal over if you don't do that, just like na let nature take its course. Now that's another thing I will point out here, um, just because I typically get a few questions related to, do you harrow your, your, pat, your bale graze pastures then in the winter time to both either remove the hay residue that you see or to say spread out the manure? And the answer is no, we, we don't. Um, basically, our, you know, we have an unwritten rule or philosophy that if nature will do something for us, we, we will go that route because, and, and particularly if nature can do a better job than we can. Uh, we'll do that. So I'll point out one thing to show you that, that nature, if you let it, uh, will typically help out. So I'll, I'll show you a few arrows there. You can see that something in those areas, hopefully now you can see it easily, has kind of scratched back uh, the residue there. And I don't know what it, exactly what it is, but it's either skunks or raccoons. And what they're looking for, I also know very well, are earthworms. Um, so this is mid-April, and, and essentially we're just starting. Probably earthworms are just getting active at this point. They're probably the most active through middle of May, maybe early June. And during that time period, when I walk around the farm, these, these, this hay residue just gets torn apart. Uh, they're, they're going after those earthworms. And if you just pull, pull that with your hand, if you go through that residue, you'll, you'll see what they're looking for. It will be full of earthworms. Um, so that's one way that, that we learn to use nature to do some of that work for us. This is uh, just about 50, 75 feet from that last picture. And this was a, a bale or an area that was bale grazed, not that winter, but the previous winter. So in other words, it had one full year to recover. And you can see it, it recovered beautifully, right? There's just a, a couple, couple tiny little areas that you can see some bare soil. Most of it, that's, you know, the seed that we put up took beautifully. Um, and looks like really nice forage. In fact, if I zoom in, it looks even better. Um, lots of things you could see in there. Two species in particular that we've learned works really good in, in kind of the, the impact zone because you will have some compaction in particular if, if it was wet is forage chicory and forage plantain. They're, they're forbs, they have a really deep, strong taproot and that will help break up that compaction. And they're kind of like a pioneer species. They won't last for a long a few years, but then your clovers, grasses um, will take over after that. So you will definitely have some short-term impact. It won't be a, a huge part of the pasture. It will be small areas, but you will definitely have impact. Um, and you know you, you just have to expect that. And, and you can learn to live with that like we have. Uh, by the way, you're going to have probably a lot more impact again in, in say a draw lot or feeding pad. So it's just you know pick your poison there. But to me, the, the more important question is this, not, you know, what, not how does it look right after the winter time, but how do those pastures look long run after bale grazing for a few years? So that's what I want to show you here. So to help do that, I'm going to show you one picture here. Uh, this is probably five, six years ago, and it, it was an area of a pasture that we had bale grazed up to that point, you know, probably four, five years, one of the probably the longest, or one of the pastures that we bale grazed the longest period of time. And what I did is this is in May, probably mid-May, and, and you know, we're in, in the start of the grazing season. And we do rotational grazing on the farm. So setting up another break, about an acre and a half or two acres of pasture that I was giving them. And I was setting up that fence that you see there. 
And while I was doing it, I noticed uh, what was obvious to me was an area that was bale grazed, not the previous winter, probably not even the winter before that, but probably three years ago. And the reason it was so obvious is it was a circle of the nicest forage you could ever imagine, uh, especially compared to anything else on that farm. And I, I thought we had pretty good forage on the bulk of that pasture, but compared to what that circle looked like, uh, it, it was not that good compared to that circle. So I saw that and I, and I thought, well, if it looks that good to me, I wonder what the cattle will think about it. So I kind of set up my own little experiment here and, and I'm sure if Pete ever got wind of this, they would not be happy at all about this, but I set that electric fence that has about 8,000 volts right on the edge of, of that circle. And that circle that I drew there is not exactly where it was, but pretty close. Um, so in other words, I gave them just a little sliver of that really nice circle of forage because I wanted to see how close were they gonna come to that fence. I took that picture less than five minutes after I, I let them into about one and a half to two acres of, of pasture. And you can see half the herd is already, what, crowding that fence right around that circle. And other cattle are, are working their way towards us. They, they communicate like this. They know when there's something good and they very quickly all will be there. So the cattle are telling me everything I need to know about long-term productivity related to bale grazing. Cattle are telling me what? that the best pasture that, or the best forage I have are in areas that were actually bale grazed in that impact zone. You will get additional fertility outside the impact zone as we've seen in other pictures, but you'll have it concentrated in that impact zone. That's where long run the best fertility will be. This is on a, another farm that we have now. Uh, we've just had management of this farm. This, this is going on our second year. We just got done with our second year of bale grazing. So this picture was taken this January. And what you're looking at, hopefully it's obvious, but let me kind of draw the, the circle in there. That was where we bale grazed the first winter. So one year prior to when I took this picture. Now you can see all, all that broom sage around that circle. And I can assure you before this was bale grazed, the area inside that circle was at least as heavily infested with, with broom sage, probably more so than anything else you see there. And the reason for that is I was trying to target areas that had the thickest broom sedge to set those bales in. So you can see just one year of bale grazing there. Uh, I didn't eliminate 100% of broom sedge, but it got rid of the bulk of it. And you can see the beautiful forage uh, run up in its place. So long run, my goal here, our goal here is essentially to, to bale graze this whole farm, transform it into what you're starting to see there without one pound of commercial fertilizer. And we'll, we'll get there. It's just a question of how long will it take. This is that same farm. Uh, the first, this was right after the first winter of bale grazing, so May of last year. I think it was earlier, mid-May. I don't remember exactly. I'll highlight again. This is obvious where the bale was, um, but I'll, I'll just make the note. This farm had been continue, continuously hayed for at least 20 years, if not longer, just based on you know what I've talked to the neighbors. Uh, the only thing, and I also talked to the, the, the local farm supply and who, who came out here every year, and all they did is they, they put on urea every spring, and that essentially was about all that was put on, at least the last 10 years. So in other words, a lot of fertility has been taken off, uh, and the only area that had thick grass that first spring were areas right around what you're looking at, right around where the bale graze, where the bales were, where the nitrogen buildup was at. By the way, one other thing, you, you can't see it quite as easily in this picture, but again, if you look at the, the hay residue around that middle of the grass area in the bale grazed area, you can see that the raccoons and skunks have, have worked this also. You can see those clumps where they're pulling back the hay and, and going for, for those earthworms. Now, I, I mentioned a number of times that how much you how much you get reductions in labor and machinery costs will, will really hinge on how well you plan things out and, and also execute. But, but a big part of that is planning. So we'll talk about that. So this this is the farm. This was the third year that they bale grazed or that I worked with them on bale grazing. The first year, just like any farm that's going to start out, they made a lot of mistakes. They learned from those mistakes. Second winter when they bale grazed, they did almost everything right. You know, really big improvement. And I, I was real happy with the direction they're heading and the results are getting, there was just one, there was just one thing that they weren't doing that I was encouraging and hoping that they would do. And that's, they were basically sending out their hay piecemeal, um, either just a couple of bales at a time or maybe a, a wagon load at a time, like eight, 10 bales at a time. And so invariably, you know, they were not doing it quite as efficiently as if you set out a third or half your hay at, at one time. So that third year, um, again, I kept encouraging them to set out 
of the bulk of their hay, they finally did that third year. So I think it was right after Thanksgiving, a few days afterwards they did. Um, they set out essentially about 100 days worth of hay. They also, you can see, had, had pretty nice stockpile on this farm that they fed with the hay. And we'll talk more about that later on in terms of that strategy of, or combination. But basically set out um, 68 bales, and it was a combination of five by six and five by fives that they purchased. Um, and they set that out in, in three and a half hours with two people. So one person had a loader tractor, the other person had a, a pickup truck with a trailer, and that tractor would load the trailer three bales at a time. They'd chalk the bales. Um, then that person would drive off the tractor, get two more bales, kind of follow along. Uh, first person would just unchalk each bale, roll them off the wagon in, into place right where they wanted them. The tractor would put two bales out. The truck would get back to the uh, where they stored the hay a little bit before the tractor would get in place. The tractor would load up, and it's just amazing how much hay you can move. And I was there to watch this, by the way, and that's why I can verify this. It's amazing how quickly you can move hay when you're set up for it like that, and you can do things efficiently. So essentially, seven man hours um, or seven people hours moving that hay, and uh, three and a half hours of, of tractor time. And from that point onward, for 100 days so until, until early March, they had no tractor on that farm, which, which was more important here because it was actually a satellite farm. So their main farm was about four or five miles away. And so in other words, if, if they're moving, if they're bringing a tractor out to move hay, it's not just the actual moving the hay while they're on the farm, it's, it's going to the farm and back. So really cut down, particularly on this farm's um, both labor and, and machinery costs. Now, during the week, it, it typically took them 45 minutes. So in other words, once the hay was out during that 100 days, every five to seven days, they would move that fence that you see and essentially give about an acre or acre and a quarter of pasture with four bales. Uh, that typically took about 45 minutes. Again, every five to seven days, very little bit, but on average about six days. So I did the calculations, but if you put, if you kind of put all the, the labor together, and that includes the, the seven people hours when they put, they set the hay out um, with the daily move or the weekly moves, six day moves, whatever that turned out to be kind of averaged out or prorated on a per day basis, it, it worked out to 14 minutes per day. So this is roughly a 40 cow operation. So if you're roughly in that that range, think about your operation during the wintertime, think about your labor and machinery relative to that. And by the way, the machinery um, time on a prorated day basis came out to two minutes uh, per day. So again, compare that to your operation. My, my guess is you're not gonna be anywhere close to that. Now that said, they did everything right this year and you're not always gonna do that. It took three years for this farm to, to get it figured out. Um, and so think of this as, as maybe the, towards the best that we're gonna be able to do. This is on that, that new farm that we uh, have been on for two years that Kenny and I have been working on. So I showed you the, the aerial view that we, that you at least long run wanna feed in kind of a checkerboard fashion to kind of spread the nutrients out and you do. Uh, but what we've been doing for at least a few years now is, is at least on a yearly basis, we don't do that necessarily anymore. We found that for us, particularly because we're, we're, we're not feeding that much hay, we, we don't have that many animals on each farm. It's more efficient for us to essentially feed in line, just kind of like what you see here. And if, if, I, if I turn around 180 degrees, look up the hill, you see the same line going up. Those bales are, are about 15 yards apart or 45 feet. And, and the reason we do this is because when we get done feeding on the, the current bale, all we've got to do is, is tip up that bale ring and move it 45 feet, plop it down and, and we're done we, and put our fence up. Actually, we put our fence up before we do that. Um, so it, it makes it a fair amount more efficient from our labor standpoint. Now, what you don't see is there's another line of, of hay uh, to the right, about 60 yards or so. And we'll work, we work through that also this winter. Now, what we'll do is every winter, we'll, we'll move those lines of hay up or down that hill. So over time, we will get that checkerboard fashion. We're just not gonna do it in one winter. Either one will work, but just think about, try to make it as efficient as possible on you in terms of your labor. Now, obviously to, to do that well, you wanna set that hay out when, when it's wet like this or when it's hopefully dry, right? Again, um, their, their efficiency is not just moving a lot of hay at one time, but moving a lot of hay at one time when it's dry. Um, my Toyota Tacoma pickup truck, I can move a full load, a fully loaded wagon of, of hay when it's dry, when I put it full drive. 
if I was trying to, you know, go through what we're looking at right now, I would, I would barely get an unload wagon through that in four-wheel drive. So, you know, that's another reason to move a lot of hay at one time, do it when, it, when the ground's either dry or frozen. There is not a lot of good research on bale grazing. There really is only one good study, in my opinion, and we're going to look at just kind of some summaries of that particular research. So this was Paul Youngnich. Um, the research he did was at University of Saskatchewan. And what he did is he broke up the research uh, farm cattle herd into two groups. Half of them, he, they bale grazed directly in pasture during the wintertime. The other half they put in a dry lot, fed them essentially equivalent amount of hay, equivalent number of, of cattle. And then they essentially, you know, scooped up all the manure in the dry lot in the wintertime and put that on equivalent area of pasture to try to make it kind of an apples to apples comparison. Now, what I'm going to show you here is just kind of summary. So we, I have, or he has lots of um, interesting data on, on the soil test data in terms of, you know, PK and nitrogen rates. And, and the, but to me, I want to know how did the forage response? So I'm going to show you the, the summary of, of the forage response. And that was over two years because you'll you know it's not just that first year you'll get those benefits for a while. So they looked at, at that over and averaged it over two years. And what we what we're going to look at is, is the control. So no manure was put on that, no cattle were on that, just the pasture without anything. What was the growth there? And then we have the drop or the the pasture that was spread from the dry lot, and we've got the pasture that they bale grazed on. So we'll start with the control. Uh, they got about two thousand pounds of of dry matter on a per acre basis. Now. In Kentucky, this would look terrible, right? We would expect hopefully at least two and a half tons or, or better on in terms of forage growth. But this is Saskatchewan, Canada. They probably get 14, 15 inches of rain per year. So in other words, their baseline is going to be a lot lower than what we would expect. So the dry lot, in fact, did a lot, or I'm sorry, the, the pasture that had the manure spread from the dry lot did a lot better, did a little over 40% better, which I thought was impressive until I saw the results from bale grazing. And essentially, bale grazing blew the, the dry lot production out of the water, more than doubled it. Um, so I'll let the numbers speak for themselves. That's about all we need to say for that. Now, I will say in, they fed at very high densities um, in this study. Again, it's Saskatchewan, Canada. The ground is frozen for six, seven months straight. So they can feed at higher densities. We're going to feed at lower densities here. So we're not going to get quite that bump on a per acre basis, same with the dry lot, that's going to be a lot less also, but we're going to spread that over a lot more acres. So in other words, we're going to get the same total benefit. We're just going to get it over more acres rather than fewer like they did in the study. Now it gets better. So that was just production. Let's talk about uh, quality of, of that production. So let's look at the protein content. So the control was just a little bit above 10%. Dry lot was just a little better, um, not enough to, to make a big difference. And the bale grazing, again, blew it out of the water. Uh, all I can say is I, I think most of us would be quite happy if, if our, our hay came anything close to 18% protein. How much would I pay for that? I don't know because I've not seen uh, round bale hay that, that's at that kind of quality. So, um, but again, they fed at very high density. So again, our protein content is going to get bumped up that high, but we're going to do it over more acres. So the question I want you to think about is why did bale grazing do so much better? And to answer it, we're gonna to have to talk about the dynamics of cattle urine versus cattle dung. So and effectively, we'll, we'll talk mainly about the urine. You'll understand essentially what that means about the dung. So it, in, it varies by species, but with cattle, their urine contains roughly two thirds of the nitrogen. Now that will vary a little bit based on the amount of protein that's in their diet, but roughly two thirds of the nitrogen will be in the urine. And with the potassium, it's even higher. 90% of the potassium will be in the urine. In other words, only 10% is, is in the dung. So two questions related to that, and hopefully it'll, it'll make the link with, with what they found in that young study. So what nutrients are most important for making hay or forage in general? And hopefully the, you understand the answer is what? Nitrogen and potassium. The next question I'll ask is how on earth are you gonna capture that? Whether it's a dry lot or a feeding pad or a feeding barn. And so again, what I'm saying is, how are you going to capture the cattle urine in, in those situations? And, and once you think about it, hopefully the answer is obvious. And the answer is you aren't. How on earth are you going to capture urine in those situations? You'll capture it in that, in that compost and bedded pack barn because you have that deep carbon source, but you are not going to capture dry lot, feeding pad, um, or feeding barn. 
And if you have any doubts about that, you can kind of conduct your own experiment with it. So get like something like a 50 to 100 gallon tank of water, take it up to your feeding pad, feeding barn, on the, right in the middle of a concrete slab, pour it all out, and with your front end loader, see how much of that you can scoop up in the next few minutes. Um, hopefully, hopefully you'll figure out real quick that you're not going to get much of that urine. All right, so let's try to put this on a per farm basis in terms of how much nutrient value are we actually capturing or getting if, if we're able to get, say, or if we're able to do something like bale grazing. And by the way, we could also say unrolling, hey, you'll get really good nutrient distribution with unrolling. It's just going to cost a little bit more to do it, and you're potentially going to compact your, your pasture in the process. So we're gonna look at three different farm size, that 25 cow farm, 50 cow farm, and 100 cow farm. On the left-hand side, we're gonna look at four different kind of nutrient, nutrient capture rates, everything from 10%, which I'm calling poor, at 75%, which I'm calling excellence. Again, that would be the bale grazing or unrolling hay. Um, and the assumption I'm making here is we're gonna feed two tons of hay per cow. We'll talk more about this tomorrow, how much, what's, what's the most profitable amount of hay that, or or stocking rate, they're really intertwined that you should be feeding at kind of current um, current cattle prices. But let's just assume two tons for the moment. And so let's just kind of look at a few numbers. So if we have a 50 cow operation, let's compare the, the bale grazing at 75% nutrient capture to, let's say, a, a feeding pad at 25% nutrient capture. And that would be my best guess. I uh, don't know precisely, but you can kind of interpret from, from the results of the young niche study that it's it's probably not anything better than 25% based on, on how much extra forage production we got with the bale grazing. So essentially with the bale grazing or unrolling hay, we're getting $2,500 of nutrient value um, it, it, at that number of cow levels with that amount of hay. With the drop or with the feeding pad uh, nutrient capture rate, we're getting about $800 of, of value. So the difference about $1,700. So yesterday we talked a lot about, you know, how can we cut costs? Um, so with the bale grazing or unrolling, hey, you're not actually going to get a check for $2,500. What that effectively would mean is you're not going to have to write that check for a fertilizer that, that you'd have to in the other situations if you want that production. Uh, what if we had 100 cows? It gets even better because we're, we're essentially doubling our, our nutrient value there. So a little over $3,000 difference between those. So it gets even better. Now I want you to also think about this. Let's say you've got a 50 cow operation or something around that. And whether or not we get the 10% capture rate or 25% at $800, I, wanna, I want you to think about the, the next question I'm going to ask here. How much does it cost you? So in that case, with bale grazing, the cattle spread it for us, right? We don't have to do anything. In fact, we're not even harrowing afterwards. If you're feeding on that pad or feeding barn, you, you still have to do what to get that nutrient value? Even that little amount that we have there, you, you've got to scoop it up and spread it, right? What's that going to cost you? Uh, it's not going to be cheap, right? And, and so I don't know this for sure, but my guess is a lot of farmers intuitively know this because I can tell you this, not many farmers actually spread that manure on, on dry or feeding pads and feeding barns. They get rid of it. Uh, but they don't generally spread it, at least from what I've seen, they don't generally spread it on pastures or hay ground that really need it. I do know some that do religiously, but all I can tell you on one hand, I can count the number of times I've seen a manure spreader on a beef cattle farm that's slinging poop. Uh, and by the way, at least two or three fingers to spare. So uh, keep that in mind that we still have the cost of what? Getting that, that manure out of there and spreading it. So that's going to take away from, from that value. Other advantage to bale grazing, these are things that I learned over the years. They weren't initially kind of obvious that there are benefits, but over a few years, particularly once I started working with cow-calf farms, um, you know, these are things I, I learned that, that are very important. First one is, is that if you bale graze, you are in a position that you can actually improve the, the kind of overall nutritional plane over, over winter. And that doesn't mean you're going to have better hay. I'll, I'll show you what I mean here in a minute. It means Basically, that bale grazing works very well with mixing that with, with stockpiled forage. Um, and I'll show you a picture, and hopefully this, this will help you understand. So look at the hay in the background. Now, they didn't have that tested, but just kind of my guesstimate, and I buy hay, so I, I, I try to, you know, I've got to essentially estimate to the best of, of my ability how good the hay quality is. I would have guessed at best that hay was maybe 9%, maybe 10% protein. There's a good chance it's only 7 or 8 uh, but I don't know for sure. But the point is, if you look at that stockpile, it, you know, this is 
this is sometime in January, that grass is still nice and green. There's a good chance that stockpile, which is mostly fescue there, is, is probably over 15% protein. But even if they're only getting one third of their diet from that stockpile and two thirds from that hay, um, and, and again, let's say the hay is 8% protein, stockpile is 15%, the combined diet is gonna put it a little over 10%. So in other words, we're boosting that overall uh, nutritional level to where it probably really needs for, for those cattle to perform well and to get through the winter in good condition. Rather than say, you know, feed, go through our stockpile, really good, you know, nutrition, and then go strictly to hay and, and kind of have that yo-yo effect. So all I can say is I, I really like feeding the stockpile for that reason. You're, you're kind of balancing their diet out. This is that same farm the fir first year that they bale grazed. You can see that they, they had no stockpile. So essentially, you know, probably 99% of, of what they're eating uh, while they're bale grazing is, is in that hay itself. So if the hay is poor quality, that's essentially all they're getting. Um, the other thing that I've learned, and this is related to herd health, is, and I will make the comment, everyone that I've worked with with bale grazing by the, by the end of their first winter has made a comment similar to the following. And that's, I cannot believe how clean the cattle have stayed all winter long. Um, and I still have some of the farmers I work with that still after the, their third winter are saying the same thing. I can't believe how, how clean that they stay. And that's because if you think typical kind of conventional practice, whether it's a dry lot feeding pad or even feeding barn, uh, where they're having, where they're going in and out, going to, back to pasture and wading through mud by, by late winter, the cattle typically are caked in mud. Uh, with a good, with good management and bell grazing, you will not see uh, pretty much any mud, uh, maybe a, above four inches or so on, on their hooves. That's about it. Um, most of them will have clean coats all winter long. So how do we translate that in a dollar sense? It's, it's kind of hard to do. It's more of a qualitative thing. It's just that, you know, if you've got cattle caked in mud, um, and gets really cold, you know, they're going to get stressed a whole lot quicker than cattle, even when it gets really cold, as long as their, their um, hide or their, their coat stays dry. I mean, they can take the cold weather. It's just when, they, when they're caked in mud that they become so cold stressed. Look, you've seen this picture before. Look at it again. Uh, um, this is kind of mid-January. It's not the worst of the winter, but think about, you know, we get some bad weather here. Cattle are gonna stay you know, pretty clean here. Think about are there options. So this is a dry lot when it's actually dry. Um, cattle probably still have mud caked on here. Here's a dry lot when it's wet. Um, I can guarantee the cattle are gonna have a lot of mud in that situation. Here's a feeding pad when it's wet. Again, uh, you can visually see mud on those cattle quite high up. By the way, again, that was Kentucky State. Uh, last year when they were using their feeding pad, they actually have made a change. They're, they're one of the farms now that I'm working with with bale grazing. This is this current winter that we're done with. Uh, I believe this was in January and uh, you can see the difference here. Um, by the way, if, if just visually, and I'm highlighting that area where you can see the, the bales and the distance here, that is roughly about somewhere between one and a half and two tons of, of hay per acre. So just in case you're wondering what that looks like, kind of that range, I like to see that that's about perfect. That's what I like to see right there. Um, look at this picture. Uh, and now what I want you to do is focus, this is also Kentucky State later in the winter time. Look at those calves, they're fall calving. So think about those calves. Uh, think about how clean they're gonna stay in this situation. Think about those same calves in that one of those dry lots or, or the feeding pad that they used to use. Think about those calves in there and, and what the health ramifications may be. We may, we may actually lose some calves. Every year I hear you know number of calves, maybe not big ones like that, but calves that are dropping in, in February, March in the mud um, and, and having death loss in that way. Here's another farm, another picture we've looked at. Again, focusing on those calves. Think about the health of those calves here versus kind of dry lot feeding pad, et cetera. So that said, I used to think that the main two benefits or the top two benefits to bale grazing were that increased pasture fertility, like we focus on, also that reduced machinery and labor costs. And, and they, they are very important benefits and they still may be the top two, but the third one now that I, I think is, is right there close to them, if, if not you know, neck and neck is, is that improved health uh, or that improved herd health aspect. Again, it's very difficult to quantify. Um, but from the farms I've been working with, that they love it. That's, again, one thing that they, they continually talk about is, is just their herd is coming out of winter in, in a lot better condition. They're not losing calves. 
Uh, they're not having animals get stressed, cold stress like they used to. So that said, if, if we didn't have any of the first two benefits, so if there was no fertility benefit, if there was no benefit or no reduction in labor and machinery costs, if all we got was that improved herd health, I would still mail graze. And, and my gut feeling is quite a few of the farms I'm working with would do the same. So we covered a lot of ground here. Um, I'm not sure how much time we have for questions here, but we're going to have at least some time for questions. And, and if we run out of time at the very end of the, of the two hours, we'll continue with questions at that time. Okay, Greg, we do have a few questions. So I think we're, we'll try and work through a few of them right now. Um, okay. The first one is, is we had a scenario, I know you touched on um, how much how many tons per acre were needed uh, to bale graze, but someone put the scenario in the Q&A box that I wanna put forward to you. Um, I feed 800 bales per year. How much space would I need um, if I feed a roughly five bales of hay a day right now? So I'm not gonna be able to answer the, you know, how many you're spacing. So you're gonna have to, you know, think about how much pasture do you wanna feed on? You know, how much tonnage of hay do you have um, and, and kind of divide the two. And, and if the answer is, is if it's well over two tons the acre, you, you may want to reconsider not bale grazing, you know, in other words, bale graze part of the winter and feed wherever else you need to the other, other portion. Um, I would, I would, maybe if I can get that person's email address or, it, by the way, you can see my email address on here. If that person can, can contact me directly, I'd be glad to work with them on that, but it, it's not something I'll be able to answer very quickly right now. So we probably better move on, but please, if, if that person would email me directly, I'd be glad to work with them. The next question is, um, you, you kind of presented it both ways, but can you go back and discuss when you should put a hay ring around your bales and when it may be best just to not use a hay ring? Sure. And again, all the farms I'm working with are using hay rings. One farm experimented uh, for a few weeks without hay rings, and they just had more waste than they were comfortable with. So they started, you know, using rings. Uh, obviously, having moving the rings, your your labor costs are going to go up a little bit. So there's a trade off, right? You, you, the trade off is increased labor versus increased waste by not having them. Um, all I can say is I do know people, in fact, the, the biggest farm I know that bale grazes personally that I've been on, I mean, I know there, there are farms in the um, high plains that, that have thousands of cows that, that they, I've just never personally been on one, but the, the farm, the biggest farm I've actually personally been on that bale grazes is in Missouri and they winter about four to 500 head a winter. They chose not to use hay rings just more for logistical reasons because they, they have so many cattle out there um, so they learn to live with it. And what they do is, again, they, they're the ones that told me you cannot put out more than two days of hay at one time for the cat or give them access to, to more than two days of hay or that waste rate goes up exponentially. Uh, and preferably one if you can do it. In other words, give them one, you know, give them access every day to another, another batch of, of hay bales. So I, other than that, I can't answer that question directly. They're almost going to have to experiment because it really is a trade-off between labor and, and additional hay loss. And, and in the end, they're going to have to make that decision, which one works for their farm. Um, we've had several questions in the Q&A box asked in different ways about how do you know when to uh, remove the net wrap or de-string the bales um, as to prevent wasps and protect the bales? Sure. Um, and we, you probably saw a number of pictures that we, the last few years we've been using not an all our hay, but a good chunk of our hay net wrap. I would actually prefer not to have net wrap because it makes it a little more challenging for bale grazing. But, but our, our number one hay supplier, he uses net wrap and he, he puts up really good quality hay. And, and so we've learned to live with it. Um, so there are two really main, main, mainly two ways of doing this. One is when you set the hay out, you, you know, with a loader track, you can cut it at that time and then set it down. Um, the only thing I would caution, you won't necessarily get a lot more weathering loss, in, you know, even if it's out there a month or two, but we've done that a few times, um, just for logistical reasons. And, and if you get a really heavy wind, at least with the hay that we have, it's, it's leafy enough that We've had a couple of really strong winds once we took that netting off that actually some of the hay kind of blew off the bale. I mean, you know, not a lot, but enough that that 
that concerns me. I wouldn't want to have it out there for weeks on end without that net wrap on. Uh, what we actually typically do is um, we will cut the net wrap off as we use it. Either you can cut it on both sides as close as you can get to the ground and then just with a hay hook roll the, the hay bale hopefully down downhill slightly. All you've got to do is go about two or three feet and you can pull the rest of that net wrap out or you can flip the, the bale on its flat side. Um, and I know to some people that may sound like it's difficult, but again, it's easy to do the hay hook. You don't even need a hay hook. And, and actually, if you will allow me, I will show you a picture related to this real quick. So this is uh, the assistant uh, farm manager at Kentucky State. They've, this is the second winter that they've bailed grazed. So this is Megan, she does an excellent job. I didn't think, I told Megan how we do it by, by flipping the bale on side. I did not expect her to do it, but I noticed that the, all the bales had been done that way. And I asked, I asked her how she was doing it. She said, I'm doing it by hand, just like you told, you told me that you could do it. So this is Megan making quick work. I mean, I would say she did a better job than, than a guard for the New York Giants there. Uh, she did a great job of, of pancaking that defensive tackle there. So it can be done. It's not as hard as it looks. A key is using gravity to your advantage. So that actually is slightly downhill. If you flip a bale slightly downhill, it actually goes a lot easier than you think. That is a four by five bale. It's going to obviously be harder than five by fives or five by sixes. Okay, we have more questions, but I'm going to ask you one last one and then we'll go on to uh, Katie's presentation and circle back to the rest of these at the end. But sure. um, you briefly touched on the hay loss, but uh, to go into that a little bit further, how, how much hay loss can you, ex do you, can you expect um, as the bales are being set out so far ahead of when the cattle are going to be eating them? And then also, do you need to be concerned about rain, given the fact that we've had such wet, you know, springs here recently? Sure. And I may not be fully understanding the question, so I'm going to answer kind of two aspects of the question to make sure that, that I'm, I'm getting it. So part of that may be um, if, if you're putting bales out, say, like I showed you the farm that, that put bales out in late November and, and didn't you know, get through all of them until early March. In other words, that hay was sitting out there for hundred, some of that hay was sitting out there for close to hundred days. So a lot of people are afraid to do that because they think that hay is going to rot. That, that may be part of the question. So all I can tell you is you'll have to do your own experiment, but I promise you that hay set out in say August when it's hot and humid is going to rot probably about 10 to 20 times quicker than hay set out in the wintertime when there's next to no biological activity going on. So hay requires hot or rot requires higher temperature to, for the biological activity to occur. We typically don't have much of that in the upper south. So I'm not going to say the, the rot is zero, but it's something very close to zero. It's, it's not enough that you will really be able to actually look at the bottom of that bale in that picture. That hay had been sitting out there for about two months. You can see about all the rot on that hay is, is just on the very surface. Um, the, so that would be one part of that question. Um, the other, and I'm, and I'm guessing on this, but, but maybe, you know, how, how quickly do you take, say, that nut wrap off? And again, we typically do that just, you know, either a, a day or two ahead of time or, or at most a week ahead of time. We, in other words, I, I had an injury here uh, about six months ago that I was recovering from. So Kenny would come over and we'd get, we would take off about a week's or a week and a half uh, of net wrap at a time and just set it on end like that. Yeah, if, if you get a rain when it's on end like that, it will soak it in quicker. But uh, you know, in a week and a half, it, it's not going to be enough to make a difference. I would definitely not set hay out like you see it right there for more than a, a few weeks at a time. I would not set that out in November and then feed it in, in March. You would not do that. Keep it on its, you know, on its round side, and, and wait until you know a week or two before you flip it like that. I appreciate all of our attendees' questions. Um, you can continue asking them in the Q and A box, but we will get the rest of the open questions addressed at the end of the the next presentation. So with that, Kenny, I'm going to let you uh, go on from here. Okay, sorry, everybody. It took me just a second there to get shared. So I think we are good to go. So 
Really good everybody's on. Greg did a, just a fantastic job with Bell Grazing presentation. I know I speak for he and Jonathan, myself, Becky, Nick, and everybody else that's on the goal. We, we're really glad that you're on and thanks for being on here for, for night number two. So this is going to be our discussion of herd management stuff. And I'm really going to cover several things. I can really make this into about three presentations if I wanted to. We're going to focus, though, on, on three major things. I'm going to discuss, first of all, how big a problem open cows are and talk about weaning rate. Jonathan talked about that the very first night. Um, then we're going to talk some about timing of getting cows bred and just the importance of, of you know, how early we get our cows bred and how quickly those calves come. And then with that will come some discussion of lot size, because I think that's oftentimes the underappreciated aspect of timing when it comes to breeding and calving. Then we'll talk a little bit about chasing weaning weight and do it almost from the perspective, you know, can I chase weaning weight too much? And that may not be the best way to word it, but we're going to talk about looking at both the value of additional pounds, but also what it actually costs to increase our weaning weight. So we'll talk specifically about value of those pounds. I'm going to give kind of an example using creep feed, and I'll talk some about just simply cows getting kind of big and, and that being one way weaning weight goes up, but oftentimes costs there are, are underestimated. So weaning rate is a fairly simple number. And again, you know, Jonathan made the point on the very opening night in the, the opening presentation that we gave, how significant weaning rate was. Very simply, it's the percent of cows exposed to a bull, the percent of cows that we manage that wean a calf each year. So when we use this term, it really combines two things. It combines breeding rate, meaning the cows that get bred with calf survival. So, you know, you could have a cow that failed to wean a calf because she didn't breed or because that calf was lost sometime after after birth, it's a simple concept. If I've got 30 cows and I wean 27 calves, that's a 90% weaning rate. If I've got 30 cows and I wean 24 calves, that's an 80% weaning rate. I like this number because it's similar to a yield measure um, when you combine it with weaning weight. So simple example here, um, if I've got an average weaning weight of 550 pounds on my herd, and I've got a 90% weaning rate, 550 pound average weaning weight times 90%, 495 pounds, I am, I am weaning 495 pounds of wean calf per cow. And again, that's similar to a yield measure. If I was talking about pounds per acre on tobacco or bushels per acre on corn or beans, this is pounds of wean calf that I've got to sell for every cow that I maintain. So I really do like that number. I would actually argue that weaning rate may be the most important number for me to know about a cow-calf operation. If I know your weaning rate and I know it's accurate, I probably know an awful lot about your operation. Good operations should be in the 90s. But folks, I can, I can, I can promise you we've got some folks out there that are weaning, you know, 70 to 80 percent calf crops. I can tell you there's a whole lot of difference in the advice that we might give someone who's weaning a 93, 94% calf crop versus someone that's weaning a 75% calf crop. There's a huge difference there. Another way to think about it is it's how we convert revenue per calf to revenue per cow. And you know, it's very easy sometimes to look at stockyard sale reports and say, okay, my average calf brought this much, but forget the fact that maybe I had 15% of my cows at home that did not wean me a calf that year that I did in fact have a full year of cost for. So it's really how I convert average revenue per calf to average revenue per cow. Now, one thing that Jonathan and Greg and I really did try to do as well as we could when we put this together was tie a lot of the pieces together. So this is a slide that Greg showed you towards the end of the presentation he gave, the first presentation he gave on opening night. And, you know, he talked about that, that cow-calf profitability article that the three of us worked on, I guess, in February of this year and talked about for a 85% weaning rate and average weaning weight of 550 pounds and a steer for average, you know, adjusting that to $1.50. Average revenue per cow was $702, specified costs were 440, depreciation and interest were 150 bucks and said, okay, if I don't, if I ignore or just take out land and labor expenses and look at it as a return to land and labor, term is $112 per cow. If you remember, he also talked about the importance of, of understanding what those costs are. If I've got if I've got land rent, you know, that's that's a cost I've got to cover. If I've got hired labor, I've got to cover that. And even if I don't, I still want some return to the land that I own that I'm tying up and some return to my labor. So it's relevant either way. But he talked about that return to land and labor, which is how most producers, I think, look at their cow calf operations. And again, this was based on an 85 percent weaning rate. I'm going to show you just the exact same thing. And all I'm going to do from that base case is change weaning rate. So 
there's what I just showed you, 85% winning rate, $702 revenue per cow, return to land and labor $112. With the 5% lower winning rate, just simply going from 85 to 80%, that return to land and labor goes from $112 down to 71. I've shaved 41 bucks off of that return to land and labor. At 75%, I've dropped now another 5%. Folks, there are folks out there that probably are weaning 75% calf crops, especially if we consider and account for um, year round calves that are out there. You know, that return to land and labor is almost zero, which means I'm, I'm covering those, those, those specified costs, I'm covering Suppose my fencing and my machinery depreciation, but I'm, I'm, I've got almost no return to the land I'm tying up or my time. Similarly, if I'm at 90%, which is why I think you know, our goal should be to be in that 90 to 95% range, that return to land and labor jumps over 150 bucks. And I'm starting to get pretty close to having a decent return or at least approaching a return to my time and to the land I'm tying up. And, and that's ultimately our goal with these cow gap operations. So weaning rate is huge. And for that reason, I really don't advocate keeping open cows. Um, I have heard cases that someone has made for keeping a cow that maybe came open her second calf or something like that. I've heard those cases before. Now, I don't get real worked up over that, but I, I just simply say that profit margins are tied in the cow-calf business. And you know, one year expenses without a calf can, can oftentimes be the difference in profit or loss over the course of a cow's life. So I don't advocate that very often. I've also heard producers tell me, and, and this, this does make sense to me, that they'll roll a calf from a spring calving herd to a fall calving herd. So if I've got two, you know, if, if I've got two herds, one that calves in the spring and one that calves in the fall, sure, you know, I, I can do that. But I always point out this really is a question of timing, right? I can't do this if I realize she's open after the rest of the cows have calved, right? That means I have to preg check and I have to know in time to know she didn't get bred and get her bred on cycle with the opposite calving season cow. So that's a question of timing, but I do think that would make sense because I'm now I'm going half a year, not a full year without a calf. Most important thing is understand what a drain open cows are on your profits. And you know they are absolutely calling candidates. Again, I'm, I'm gonna say it again that you know I really think if you're if you're under 85%, certainly under 80% weaning rate. I think the most important thing you can do is focus on using culling as a way to get you to a higher winning rate. That's going to have the biggest impact probably on, on your bottom line period. Now, after moving beyond that discussion, I think the solid follow-up is, is getting bred enough. And I want to make this distinction between calving every year versus calving every 12 months. And, and I'm well aware that a lot of folks out there don't have a defined calving season. I'm a proponent of a defined calving season. The main reason, frankly, being that it's hard to manage a moving target. And the nice thing about a defined calving season is it's pretty easy to know when, you know, when cows add, when they're open and whatnot. And, you know, the, these year-round calving operations, there's always a tendency to think, yeah, I think she's close to calving, right? And we really don't know exactly how far behind she is. So if you're in a, if you're in basically a year-round calving system, I like to say start by managing calving interval. Simply write down your calving dates track those birth dates and you're looking for breaks. You want to look, you want to look for cows, you, you want to keep cows that are weaning a calf every 12 months, start there. And as you start getting rid of some of the cows that have got longer, longer calving intervals, then I think you might tighten up that calving season as you do that. Kind of a simple illustration here, if I've got a cow that consistently has 15 months between calves that she, that, that, sorry, has 15 months between calving, that means she's going to produce, a, produce four calves in 60 months. And folks, that's the same thing as an 80% calving rate, or sorry, an 80% weaning rate. So understand that that's a key number. And part of her job is not just to get bread, but it's to get bread and calf on a consistent annual basis. Now, when we talk about late calving cows, oftentimes the cost of late calving cows is couched in terms of lost weaning weight. And that is a huge cost. For every cycle that's missed, you know, 21 days, is, you know, there's pretty good data to say that, you know, two pounds per, per day is decent, decent expected weight gain for a calf. For every cycle that I miss, assuming I wean all my calves at the same time, and most of us do, I'm probably giving up about 40 or so, you know, 40 to 45 pounds of weaning weight. And if I value that weaning weight, those additional pounds using price slide, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but the true additional value of another 40 pounds is probably 30 to 40 bucks. 
but that's very significant. So in other words, if I, if I have a cow that gets bred the third cycle instead of the first cycle, her calf's probably going to be worth 30, 30 to $40 times two, so 60 to $80 just looking at weaning weight. So here's a simple illustration. If I look at a fall calving, I'm sorry, a spring calving herd, first calf being born on February 15th, and then I kind of just back up and say, okay, those calves that came first, those cows got bred, you know, soon after I turned the bull out. For those cows that got bred on their first cycle, the average birth date of those calves might be February 25th. And the second cycle, maybe March 18th, third cycle, April 8th, and so on. And again, just simply using a birth weight assumption and that two pounds of gain per day, you can see just an estimated weaning weight for those calves based on how soon they came in the calving season. And again, no surprise, those calves that came earlier were, were much heavier. Now, in addition to weaning weight and valuing those pounds, there's another place that I want to go here that I think is just as important. And I think this is really the piece that's not been discussed as much when we think about the importance of timing of cow getting bred and simply calves coming earlier in the calving season. I reached out to a friend of mine that I've known for about 20 years in the stockyard business. And I just asked this question. I said, okay, cow calf operator unloads a group of calves. You know, maybe he's got 30 or 40 cows or She's got 30 or 40 cows. I said, how much spread? You know, we, you break out those steers and heifers. How much spread do you want to see or are you willing to tolerate between the heaviest calf and the smallest calf within each cut? I was a little surprised by the answer. It was actually a smaller range than I expected, but I was told between 50 and 75 pounds. I also made a really good point that I'd actually never thought about, but he said this is more important on a smaller group. So Think about this for just a second. If you've got 50 calves standing in a sale, if the sale ring's full, okay, you've got a full sale ring, 30 or 40 calves standing in there, you know, it's pretty easy to hide a hundred pound spread, right? It's not gonna be obvious. On the same note, if I've got five or six calves standing in the ring, a hundred pound spread looks a whole lot more obvious. So in reality, the fewer calves that I've got in a lot of ways, the more I've got to kind of tighten up the difference between the, the high and the low weight as I make those cuts for sale um, from those cow-calf operations. And this is the most important slide that I'm gonna show you for this section. And I use this a lot in the county programming that I do. Some work that Greg and I did back in 2015 using some preconditioned sale data from Bluegrass Stockyard. So I wanna make sure you understand um, the chart that I'm showing you. Across the x-axis, okay, this is lot size, meaning how many calves ran through the ring at one time. And we had a lot of very large groups that ran through. We had a lot of singles, twos, threes, fours, fives, and so on. Okay, so we had a good coverage. Actually had a probably more down here in the lower lot size range than the higher lot size range. So the x-axis here is, is just the number of cattle that ran through the ring at one time. That was the group, if you will. Okay. The y-axis is just simply price improvement per hundred weight. And you can think about that kind of like price premium. Now, understand this was a statistical analysis, first of all. So we held everything else constant that we could think of that was relevant. We, we held fed cattle price constant. We held corn price constant. We held seasonality constant. We held the weight of the calves constant. All those things you can think of. So this chart really does try to isolate what was the price advantage as I simply had larger lot sizes, meaning as more calves were sold together. Now, the mathematical formula behind what you're saying here is such that this first point is not zero, zero, and it's a lot size of one, okay? So in other words, lot size of one, a single was kind of our base. And then from there, we would be able to change. So after this single or this lot size of one, every circle is five head. Now, I'm gonna start on the far right side. The average weight of these cattle was like 630 pounds or something like that. So right here is roughly a truckload. So the first thing you can look at and say, okay, so that means a truckload, a pot load, outsold a single by about 20, 21 bucks a hundred weight, and it did. But again, the real story here is not so much on the right side. The real story is on the left side. So let me illustrate it quickly. So again, here's a single, group of five, group of 10, group of 15, group of 20. From the group of 20, they go back and look at the group of 15. 
on average, would a group of 20 outsell a group of 15? The answer was yes, by about a dollar a hundred weight. Would a group of 15 outsell a group of 10? The answer was yes, now by a bit more, by about two bucks a hundred weight. A group of 10 would outsell a group of five by about four bucks a hundred weight. And again, the extreme I'm going to show you, a group of five, only a group of five, outsold a single by about 11 bucks a hundred weight. So naturally, if we could all move truckloads of cattle, that would be ideal. But the vast majority of us don't do that. Folks, the real story is not so much about having to be on the right. It's I've got to stay out of the left as much as I possibly can. And the point that I want to make here is that even groups of five and ten, although those are not large groups in a lot of ways, they tend to do so much better based on price. It gives the buyer so much more to work with. So it's another reason why uniformity matters and why calving season and how early those calves come and how tight those windows are matters. Okay. Now, this is simply for illustration, but I wanted to just do a kind of a quick spreadsheet analysis to just make a quick point. So don't look at this and say this is representative of anything. It's just what we assumed. All right. But I'm going to basically go back and say, OK, what if 40 percent of my cows got bred first cycle, 25 second cycle, 10 percent on the third cycle and then 5 percent on the fourth and fifth cycle? And then say, OK, now what does that probably mean about the number of calves and, the, and what they weigh when they sell? OK. Now, when I combine those two things, in other words, when I go back and look at, okay, you know, these, these cows that were that calved earlier, I'm sorry, that were bred earlier and calved earlier, they weighed more and there were more of them. So they were sold into larger groups. These cows that were bred and calved later had smaller calves, but they also sold in smaller groups because there were fewer of them. There's basically a double whammy, right? So the first column that I'm showing you is the revenue per calf. And this is actually a steer heifer average. I'm using a base price for the steer of $1.40. I'm using a $15 heifer discount, meaning a, a heifer at the same weight sells for $1.25. And then I'm adjusting the price with a pretty, pretty steep price slide. So those lighter cattle do get the benefit of a $15 per hundred weight price slide, meaning an upward price adjustment for 100 pounds when they're heavier. I want you to notice though that when I just look at the weight impact, there's definitely a difference here. But even going from cycle one and two, assuming those can be put together, cycle three and four, if those we put together, we're talking 20 to $25 or so. And even those stragglers in cycle five, which is late, we're talking 90 days now after turning those bulls in, they got bred. Difference here is about, you know, 75 or so dollars when I count for everything. When I add in the lot size though, this is when it gets really interesting. When I count for the fact that not only are those, those late calving cows gonna wean lighter calves, they're also gonna sell in smaller groups. And we think again at just how steep that discount is for these really small groups. And I assumed a 50 cow herd here. So, you know, that's, that's actually above Kentucky's average. But the point I want to make is I've got, a, I've got a small number of those, what I'm going to call straggler cows. The actual difference when I start including both of those, those cycle three and four cows on average, if those get put together about 66 bucks per calf difference. And folks, when I get into cycle five, where I've got some really small groups and basically almost no no lot size advantage, we're over 150 bucks. Again, I think lot size is what oftentimes gets ignored. It's the other piece of the late calving puzzle that we forget sometimes. Not only are those calves lighter, there'll be fewer of them, which means they're gonna get, you know, they're gonna get, you know put in groups of singles, you know, ones and twos, and I'm gonna get hit again. So I really think we ought to oftentimes underestimate the impact on our bottom line from those late calving calves if we don't think about the lot size effect too. Um, so understand a couple of things kind of wrapping this section up. So the impact of late calvers is actually larger for smaller herds. And think about it this way. If I've got, if I've got four or 500 cows and 5% of them calve late, I've, I've, got, I've still got a pretty decent sized group of calves to sell with those trappers, right? If I've got a 50 cow herd and I've got one or two cows that calve really late, then those calves are going to end up selling by themselves. So it's really a bigger issue for smaller, smaller herds is much more we have in Kentucky. The other problem that we have, I think, is when, when you think about even though, you know, even if, you know, even if I've got $150 difference in value in calves for those, you know, really, really late calving cows versus the early calving cows, when I divide that across my entire herd, it seems small on a per head basis. But this is kind of the danger of manager, managing averages. And I want you to be careful about that. 150 bucks a head is not insignificant at all. And don't let that get caught out in the wash. We manage individual cows, we don't manage averages. 
cannabis. So don't ignore how important these late cabin cows can be. And again, I think they should be culling candidates in a lot of cases because once those cattle are off cycle and calving late, it's going to be hard to get them backed up very much the following season. So we'll have that as an ongoing problem. The second half of this, I'm going to focus really on weaning weight individually. And I'm going to ask this question, can I get too focused on weaning weight? And I think it's a fair question and maybe it's being too focused isn't the best way to word this. We're going to really talk about, you know, is, is weaning weight, always, is more weaning weight always better? And we're going to really do two things. We're going to, first of all, we're going to value, okay, how do I really want to value additional pounds? We're also going to talk about, okay, what are some ways I can try to estimate how much, how much additional cost I'm going to have from some common ways that weaning weight gets increased. So the first concept I want to teach, and I've mentioned price slide a couple of times already, I want to talk about value of gain. And this is one of the most common mistakes that I think people make when they try to analyze the economics of cattle operations is they assume that additional pounds are worth the average price. We're all aware that price slide decreases price per pound as calves get larger. I hear this a lot. I'll hear someone say something to the effect of, you know, if I've got, if my full cost of gain, including feed, vet medicine, everything is, let's just say 90 cents a pound of gain. They'll say, if I can put on gain for 90 cents and calves are selling for $1.50, well, I can put on gain for 90 cents and sell for $1.50 and make money six days a week and twice on Sunday. They're comparing their cost of gain to the current price of whatever cattle they're looking at. Okay. And again, there's a difference in value of gain and average price. And I want to illustrate that. What really matters is how much of the additional pounds of work that I'm going to add. So here's a very simple illustration. To keep the math simple, I'm going to assume a $10 per hundred weight price slide. What that means is for every additional 100 pounds of weight of calves that I'm selling, price decreases by 10 cents a pound or $10 a hundred weight. So here's my example. Let's say a 550 pound steer sells for $1.40 or $1.40 a hundred weight. That 550 pound steer is worth $770. With the $10 price slide, if instead I've got 600 pound steers, okay, for every 100 pounds over 550 those cattle are, I'm gonna expect the price to come down by about 10 bucks a hundred. 600 pounds is $50 higher, that's half of that. So those 600 pounders sell for $1.35 or 135 a hundred weight, they're worth $810. The additional value of those 600 pound calves versus those 550 pound calves is $40 per head. And again, that was on 50 pounds. So $40 divided by 50 pounds is 80 cents of value per additional pound. That's the value of gain. That's the benefit that I'm chasing when I increase weaning weight. Value of gain is not $1.40, not $1.35. In this case, it's 80 cents when I count per price slide. Now, I wanna just kind of show you kind of on a chart and we love these charts. Economists love this kind of stuff, but it, it allows you to take something away from this conference where you can kind of look at over a wide range of prices. So that's kind of what we're going to do. So here's what I just showed you. 550 pounds steer cap at 550, price slide at 10 cents a hundred weight, value of gain is 80 cents. If I use the exact same $1.40 base price for the 550 pound steer, but I now I've got a $15 a hundred weight price slide, because there's more discount on those heavier calves, then that value of gain goes from 80 cents to 50 cents. That's very significant. Here's the other end of it. If I've got a $1.40 base price and a much more narrow price slide, meaning less discount on additional pounds, value of gain is $1.10. And I can kind of fill that out for this row. Okay, obviously, obviously the, 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 the lower the price slide is, the less price discount on additional pounds and the more, the greater the value of gain actually is. Now, here's the same thing for all of those price slides with a $1.60 base price. Again, holding everything else constant, stronger cap market, each of those boxes, I've got a 20 cent higher cost of gain, I'm, I'm sorry, 20 cent higher value of gain than I did in the $1.40 cap market. And I can fill the other two out, okay? So I want you to understand the value of gain is really a function of the price, meaning the value of the calves in the market, but also the price slide. Holding everything else constant, higher calf prices, higher value of gain, 
lower price flag, higher value of gain. Now I highlighted what I'm going to call a range of a range of reasonability, a range of reasonableness. Price slides and overall prices tend to move together. In other words, when calf prices are really high, we see really big price slides. So think back to 2014-15, calf prices, you know, for a five-weight steer are kind of around 240 or so. We saw price slides around 25 bucks a hundred weight. And those seemed really high, really wide at the time when they were. But again, they were they were high because the overall market was higher. So in a normal year, and in most years, the true value of gain tends to be between about 60 cents and a dollar. So I've kind of highlighted in yellow what's kind of a reasonable expectation for value of gain. You know, you, you wouldn't see a really high cap market and a really low price slide. They tend to move together. And then here's the exact same thing. And all I've done now is I've just multiplied everything by 50 pounds. So now this is kind of back where we started. This would be the value of additional 50 pounds. And again, when I see people misuse um, value of gain, sometimes they'll say, you know, another 50 pounds of winning weight and a dollar 50 cap market's worth 75 bucks. And truthfully, it's not. It's worth usually something between 30 to 35 and up to about maybe 50. $50. So, you know, a reasonable range for value gain is usually 60 to 60 cents to a dollar. And in 70 to 80 is what I typically think of as reasonable. So like 70 to 90 maybe. So understand what value gain is. Now, another point that Jonathan made on night one that was very important was most of the time there's a cost to additional winning weight. Now, sometimes there's environmental factors, weather that, you know, that they're out of our control. But for example, if winning weight goes up, there, there's oftentimes something we've done differently. Have we bought bulls with more growth traits? Have we improved our forage program? Are we creep feeding? Have our cows gotten larger? All of those could be potential explanations for larger weaning weights. And all of those have a cost. So when we start thinking about, um, we start thinking about the economics of larger weaning weights, we don't just have to look at what the additional pounds are worth, but also what did it cost to get them? I'm going to give you kind of a quick illustration using creep feed. It's kind of an easy way to show you how to compare the two. I'm going to talk about cows here at the end. So there is no doubt creep feeding will increase weaning weight. The literature is very, very clear on that. Um, but you've got to decide whether it's worth your time and effort and most importantly, the cost of the feed, right, to actually creep feed for the purpose of increasing weaning weight. Put simply, the value of the additional pounds that you put on those calves at weaning time, in other words, how much more they weigh than they would have if you not crib fed, has got to exceed the cost of that feed. And in reality, it's got to exceed however you value your time and any, any investments like the creek feed or, or something like that. So there's probably going to be some capital investments. They may be pretty small with creek feed. And again, I'm, I'm going to use a fairly simple illustration here, another two way table that you can kind of take with you when this is over. Across the top here, I've got value of gain. Okay, so again, we just kind of walk through what value of gain meant and how we got there. We use that based on the average cap market and the average price slide in the marketplace. So value of gains across the top. And then on the left side here is what I'm going to just simply call creep to gain ratio. Now, this is not dry matter basis. This literally is how many pounds do I put out for every pound of actual additional weaning weight that I get. So it's not necessarily a dry matter feed conversion, but this is what matters from an economic perspective, right? What do I spend? What do I get? I'm going to kind of fill this out. Now, I'm going to base feed cost at, I'm um, creek feed cost at $200 a ton. I know that's low. I'm going to show you something higher in just a couple of minutes, but I'm going to use $200 a ton for a very good reason. It makes the math nice and simple for illustrative purposes. So $200 a ton creek feed, $200 a ton, 2,000 pounds is 10 cents a pound. Okay. So with a six to one creep to gain ratio, $200 a ton or 10 cent a pound feed, six to one means I've got 60 cents of feed for every pound of gain that I'm putting on. With the 60 cent value of gain, there's, there's no gain there whatsoever, just looking at the cost of the creep feed. That's, that's ignoring my time, ignoring any investment that I've got. Now, if I have a slightly less attractive creep to gain ratio, meaning I've got to put out eight pounds of creep feed for every additional one pound of winning weight, okay, let's kind of walk through that really quickly. That means I've got an 80 cent per pound cost of additional gain. In a 60 cent value gain market, that means I'm actually losing 20 cents on every pound that I gain, or every, every, I'm sorry, every pound that I add. If I'm valuing 30 additional pounds of winning weight, 20 cents a pound at 30 pounds of additional weight, I'm actually $6 worse off 
in terms of just feed cost by creep feed. Okay, back to the base case now, here's a slightly higher value of gain market. Okay, now I'm at a six to one creep to gain ratio, 70 cent value of gain. The benefit here above feed cost is $3 on 30 pounds of additional weaning weight. And here's the same exact thing if I'm back at the eight to one. And again, my at 80 cent cost to gain, I don't quite get a benefit of 70 cent value of gain market. So I just want you to understand the concept here, what I'm showing you. The point you need to understand is generally to make creep feeding truly pay, meaning for the value of the gain to exceed the additional cost for the additional pounds of weaning weight, I've got to have pretty attractive creep to gain ratio, not a lot of waste. I've got to have fairly attractive value to gain, right? I certainly wouldn't want to creep feed if I were here in the lower left. I only want to creep feed here if I'm in the upper right. Now, hopefully that, that illustrated the concept pretty well. I'm going to show you the exact same thing now using what I'm going to call a more, a more current feed price. So this table is the exact same thing, but now uses $250 a ton feed. I made one change on you. Notice the creep to gain is the exact same on the left side, 6 to 1, 8 to 1, 10 to 1, 12 to 1. But I've actually had to shift the value of gain to the right. Simply put, with higher feed cost, this doesn't work at all with a 60 or 70 cent value of gain. So I have to have at least 80 cents to make it work. And to make it attractive, I've really got to be probably at a dollar or better. And now, a couple of comments. Number one, I just want you to see this. The most important thing is that you understand the concept of what I'm showing you here. Can you compare value of gain to additional, to additional cost using something like creep feed? Um, my point here is not necessarily to say that you should or shouldn't creep feed. If you look at what you're seeing here, you can see why I've never been a huge proponent. I think it's oftentimes about a wash with the dollars and cents of it, right? You know, even some of these more attractive scenarios, if I multiply this by the number of calves that I'm actually creep feeding and think about the amount of time it takes and the investment, it may or may not be something that's attractive to me. But again, the most important thing is you understand how to do it. Now, there are some other reasons to creep feed. And anyway, it's not all about dollars and cents at weaning time. If you keep your calves past weaning, there may be some benefit if you're gonna put them in like a backgrounding program, understood. Some folks will argue that, you know, by, by creep feeding that frees up a little bit of pasture for cows. Okay, maybe some, but I'm gonna argue it's probably fairly small for those calves. But again, the most important thing here is not, I'm saying, not that I'm saying you shouldn't creep feed. I, I'm not a huge fan myself. I kind of say, eh, it's just kind of a wash usually, but it's that you understand how to, how to look at it appropriately. And the key here is to understand that additional weaning weight, especially through something like creep feed is not free and value the cost the same way that you value the additional pounds. The last topic I want to talk about related to weaning weight involves cow size. And uh, this is work that I did two or three years ago, and I've shown pieces of this over time. I'm going to kind of show you a little bit more here tonight. But it's well, it's well known that cows have been getting bigger for decades. We're, we all know that. Um, you know, we've gotten more fish in EPD. Lots of reasons why cows are getting bigger. It's also well known that larger cows cost more to maintain. Nobody really ever argues that, okay? But when it comes down to what to do with it, that's where it becomes a challenge. This is complicated by, by two more things. First of all, is that very few farmers truly know cost production. And then that's just a fact. It's difficult to come up with cost production on a cow-calf operation. You know, we tried to walk through some things with you, but we understand it's a challenge. So, you know, we certainly want to challenge you to get a handle on that number. Um, after watching this program the next or over, over these three nights. But even producers that know their cost of production, what's important to understand is what they really know is they know that on average, right? They may know what it costs them to maintain 50 cows and they can divide that by 50. And what that means is they know what it costs them to maintain their average cow. And there's a danger again, sometimes in managing averages instead of individuals. Here's an illustration. So let's just kind of use a simple, simple scenario here. I've got a $1.50 steer calf market and a $0.15 cent per hundred, $15 per hundred weight price slide. Let's just say I've got three cows in front of me and I've got to cull one of those cows. All right, one, one every single year, Chuckle Chuckle wins me a 550 pound calf, one wins me a 500 pound calf, one wins me a 450 pound calf, okay? In a $1.50 calf market, that cow that weans me a 550 pound calf, I've got revenue for her of $825. The 500, the cow that, that weans me a 500 pound calf consistently, 
price is higher. I've got a pretty significant slide here. So she gets a nice benefit on price. The revenue is still lower though, 788 bucks. My, my cow that wins a 450 pound calf, you know, that, that calf sells for $1.65, but again, revenue is still lower. So her, her revenue is 743 bucks. And if I just simply say, which of these three cows probably gets cold first, we all would point to the bottom here and say, what's well, probably gonna be that, you know, that cow that wins me the smaller calves. Here's the problem though, okay? Most likely those cows don't weigh the same. Okay, so most likely the cows weighing these larger calves on average are gonna be larger cows themselves. So if I consistently simply call cows that wean me smaller calves, over time, I'm gonna be naturally selecting for larger and larger cows. I'm gonna be driving my cost up. So what I'm really gonna try and do is give you some ideas on how can I think about, okay, if I've got larger cows, how many more pounds of weaning weight should I be expecting from those larger cows compared to some of my smaller cows? That's kind of the purpose of where we're going here. Here's just a simple listing of some basic cow maintenance cost. And just kind of think in your mind, which of these are gonna go up or which of these are gonna change based on cow size? Will winter feed cost go up? Absolutely. Larger cows will consume more hay or more feed in the winter. Pasture cost. Larger cows will consume more pasture. We may not see it, but they will. They'll consume more mineral. Vet medicine is kind of one of those that kind of go either way. Um, if you think about the amount of time it takes to work cattle in terms of vet expense, that probably doesn't change. If you think about things like dosages for vaccines and wormers, it may well. You know, trucking cost can go either way, but if I think about, you know, does it cost more to truck, you know, larger, larger calves that come from, uh, from larger cows? Sure. Same thing on marketing. Breeding is one that probably honestly doesn't change based on cow size. You may or may not agree, but that's, that's probably one that I would argue is probably least likely to have, well, least likely to be impacted by cow size. So there's been some work done in the past, and several years ago, I got to go to a conference that Alltech put on, and there's an animal scientist, I cannot remember her name, but did an outstanding job and talked about a meta-analysis and looked at basically how correlated is mature cow size with weaning weight. And you know what, what she shared from the data was that, yeah, larger cows do wean larger calves, but not proportionally so. And she was quick to make the point that there were, there were exceptions. You, know, you may have some that do, but on average, they did not. And again, this is complicated by the fact that tracking individual cow revenue is actually possible, right? You know, if, if we can track our cows back to our calves back to their dam and we know what our weaning weights are, or our sell weights are, we can pretty much estimate, you know, revenue on a per cow basis individually, right? But we can't track individual costs very easily. We, we can in an experimental type setting, but not on a farm setting. So our concept was, can we use average cow cost and then just adjust that for different mature cow sizes? And think, kind of think about things at the margin. So here's what we did. So we took our just a simple cow-calf budget and kind of calibrated it for a 1,200-pound cow. And we made some assumptions to do the exact same thing for a smaller cow at 1,000 pounds, and then we did it for 1,400, 1,600-pound cows, all right? The assumptions that we made were that feed cost, pasture cost, and mineral cost all increased proportionally. So another way to say that is we assumed that a 10% larger cow consume 10% more winter feed, consume 10% more pasture and 10% more mineral. We assumed that breeding costs were unaffected by cow size. And then with the others that we talked about, vet medicine, transportation and marketing, we assumed they were roughly half proportional. So in other words, we assumed that a 10% larger cow had a 5% larger vet medicine cost. Those were assumptions that we made. When I talk about this, an astute person will oftentimes say, well, you know, don't larger cows produce larger cull cows? And isn't that a benefit? It absolutely is. And we did try to adjust for that. We, we did account for the fact that there was, they would be larger, um, larger cull cow value at the end of a larger cow's productive life. But we also had to adjust the front end too. And these larger framier heifers, larger framier, you know, breeding stock that are sold when they're younger, they also sell for more too. So that is an advantage, but when you account for both ends, it's not as big an advantage as you actually would think, but we tried to account for that. I'm not gonna go through the gory details here due to time, I'm trying to be efficient with, with your time this evening, but I want you to understand what our basic findings were, okay? And our basic findings were that for every additional 100 pounds of mature cow size that we were managing, we needed about another 50 pounds of weaned calf to justify the cost of keeping that larger cow. So another way to say it is, if I've got a 1400 pound cow 
she needs to wean me about a hundred pound larger calf than a 1200 pound cow. But kind of keep that in the back of your mind. That's, that's kind of how you want to calibrate. 100 pounds of mature cow size, I need to get about 50 more pounds of weaned calf. Now, obviously capturing mature cow weights is ideal. Some of you may be able to do that. A lot of us probably can't. So one idea that we had was, can we simply calibrate this through our cull cow weights? Can we use that to get an estimate of what our mature cow sizes are? And then can we almost kind of groove our cows, right? So when you're looking at your, when you're looking at your weaning weights on your cows and you kind of eyeball on those cows, you know, if you see two weaning weights that are very, you know, that are very different, you know, see if you see an extreme difference in those cow mature sizes. You know, look for things like that and kind of train, train your mind to think about it that way. But again, you know, roughly 100 pounds of mature cow size need about 50 more pounds of weaning weight. Interestingly enough, when we start talking about this, and people I really respect, in fact, a, a very good county agent friend of mine that's retired now, I've talked to him today, in fact, so he said, he said, Kenny, I think you're right, but he said, you'll never sell this. And he, and he made a good point. And a lot of the pushback came down to fear of selling small frame calves. And I fully get that. So I want to first of all understand, I want to just make sure we're all clear about what, what a frame size or frame score is, okay? Frame grades, meaning, you know, um, medium, uh, medium, or sorry, small, medium, and large are based on expected finish weight with half an inch of back fat. Now, in two studies that I was involved with, one was part of my dissertation, the second one was one that Greg and I worked alone on, or worked, worked together on alone back in 2015, we found significant discounts for small frame calves. So it makes sense to be concerned about this. But I also wanna make this point, and I had to go back and, and kind of look at this myself. Um, so at my high school, I teacher was actually my father, and I believe he's on the program tonight. So he was also my animal science teacher. So I had to actually go back and, and remind myself about frame scores. But to be a small framed animal, a steer is one the grader has to look at and say, okay, I think when that animal is finished with half an inch of back fat, it's gonna finish at a finish weight of less than 1,100 pounds and for a heifer, 1,000 pounds. And if you look at current carcass weights and make an assumption about dressing percentage, our average live weights now that we're moving through packing plants are well in excess of 1,400 pounds. So the only point I'm trying to make here is certainly you want to avoid selling small frame calves due to the discount, but also understand we're probably a pretty long ways away in most cases from that being an issue. And again, you know, we, we tend to group our mediums and larges together. So the biggest thing is you want to avoid those smalls and just understand that small truly means a calf that's going to finish, meaning half inch of back fat, you know, targeted choice for a steer at less than 1100 pounds. Now you want to make mature cow size part of your culling criteria and just understand conceptually the danger of ignoring this is if you're consistently just culling cows that wean smaller calves unknowingly you're going to be driving your mature cow sizes up and that's going to be driving your cost up over time. So be aware that some additional culling candidates are going to be some of those cows that are bigger but are not weaning proportionally larger cows and kind of keep that 50 pounds of weaning weight for every additional 100 pounds of mature cow size in the back of your mind and do understand what a small frame calf truly means and know that we're probably a ways away from that in most situations. Now, these are my last thoughts I'm going to leave you with kind of wrapping up this presentation. And I'm just going to summarize in a few bullets what I've talked about in the last 40, 45 minutes. Again, biggest bang for your buck. Okay, If you don't track weaning weight, start, start today. Okay? Open cows are a problem. If your true weaning rate, meaning the percent of cows you expose to a bull is south of 80%, and I would really argue south of 85%, there probably isn't much you could focus on that would have any more impact on your bottom line than bumping that up. Target weaning rates over 90%, period. Understand timing matters too. And I try to provide kind of one way to look at the cost of cows that get bred late, but understand that's, that's going to be a perpetual issue. Okay, so Sometimes you've really got to think about making some tough decisions based, even if, even if she breeds consistently, if she's off cycle, you know, she might fit better with someone else's herd that calves a bit later than yours. So, you know, you may have to think about some of those calves going on the truck as well. Again, understand the value of additional pounds of winning weight and really understand cost versus trade off So, you know, don't just look at the value of the pounds, look at them appropriately and also think about the additional cost. So we talked about cow size. We also talked about Creek feed kind of as, as an illustration. Try to look at the cost and the value of additional pounds of weaning weight. If I could boil it down to one thing, it's this. Um, 
the more I work with cow calf operators across the state, frankly, the more I become convinced we don't use culling enough for the tool that it is. Culling is a valuable tool at your disposal. It's how you make major changes in the composition of your herd. It's how you keep your herd profitable. Open cows, late calvers, large cows that wean smaller calves. Folks, those are some of the cows that we've talked about that probably need to be targets for culling in the future. And keep those in the back of your mind. I like to joke that sometimes you gotta cull so hard a dog's nervous, but I would bet money that in the vast majority of our cow herds out there, we would benefit from more culling as opposed to less. That's my bias. My contact info, by all means, reach out to me anytime. Uh, Greg put his up earlier, here's mine. Uh, reach me by phone, email, follow me on Twitter, at KYCattleEcon. We're gonna stop now and we'll certainly take some questions from this presentation or the next presentation. So I don't forget, Becky, this is the Cape code for tonight. I was really creative again, CCPC, Cal Calf Profitability Conference, WEB for Wednesday. So if you're, if you're, if you're getting Cape credit for this, cost share, put CC, <laughs> CCPC WED in for, the, uh, in for the presenter line, and that should work in terms of your certification. Thanks so much. I will stop sharing. Thanks, Kenny. Uh, we do have a few questions that we'll work through, and then we, are, we have some open questions left from Greg's presentation as well. So the first one is, do cows with calves on creep feed tend to add more weight than cows, cows and calves on just a hay diet? I think I understand. I think the question is, will creep feed get you more weaning weight than if you just simply keep on, on the cow? Okay, yeah, and there has been some work done on that. The answer is yes. And ultimately, when people look at the creep, that's kind of what they're looking at, right? The, the right way to do those studies is, is you compare you compare calves that have been not creep fed with those that have. Okay, so the answer is yes. But understand too, the creep to gain ratios I was showing you, those were based on those were not weaning weight. That was the additional weaning weight from the creep. So the answer is yes. But understand, I try to look at it marginally. How many additional pounds did I get just from the creep above what they would have got had they just been on the cow and her being fed hay, whatever. Um, the next question, I'm not sure that you'll, you might want to refer to our other beef extension specialists, but how old should a heifer be before being bred? Yeah, that's a better question for the animal science folks. I mean, what, what the norm obviously is, is, you know, we, most of us will have our cows calved the first time around two years of age. A lot of folks don't push that more to two and a half, but, but that's a question definitely for one of our animal science folks. It's probably a better question for probably less. I'm, 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 I'm going to ask Les to bail me out and refer him to Les on that one. Um, so the next question, um, it's a little long, so you might want to open up the Q&A box and read it too, but we are building a herd and keeping the registered heifers to build the herd and changing out a registered bull every three to five years. First time heifers have more calving issues and sometimes take a while to breed. We run the bull continuously with the herd and we now have 25 breedable heifers and cows on 100 acres with about 25 acres of hay field and 70 acres of reclaimed grazing land while running about 90% calving and weaning rate. I have provided a lot of cheap entertainment for my neighbors but any general comments or advice would be appreciated. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think I understand the bulk of the question and you, much like Greg did earlier, you know, feel free to email me directly about specifics like that. If, I, if I'm not, if I understood what they were trying to say, I think they're basically saying that they don't have a defined calving season, but they also were saying that they're in a different, a different environment, right? So that they're, they were seed stock producers, right, Becky? So understand the way that I tried to, the way that I tried to value the loss on those late calving cows was using a combination of weaning weight and um, lot size, right? So in a seed stock environment, I take that to mean they're selling, they're selling bulls, they're selling breeding stock, they're selling heifers. So it's a little bit different game. There probably are some synergies to having um, more of a calving season, even in the seed stock. But on the same note, I'm not gonna assume that I understand how you market either. 
And I guess my philosophy is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So if that's working for you and your market is such that you're happy with what you're getting for your heifers and your bulls, just, you know, I think that's fine. What I showed you really was assuming a commercial cow-calf operation. Um, the next question is a farmer's market related question. Um, our farmer's market customers prefer the moderate sized cuts from our small framed Dexter influenced calves. Do you think too much emphasis has been placed on size at the expense of consumer preferences? Okay, so that's, a, they're, I think they're asking me about if they're selling at a farmer's market. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, that, again, that's very different. Don't confuse what I'm talking about with winning weight with necessarily what that means for you if you're direct marketing through a farmer's market. Um, you know, we do we do some great marketing freezer beef, for example, and we like to have pounds to sell. I think what you're saying is for a for a market at a farmer's market, if I hear you right, what you're saying is if frame size is really big and I go to think about just a normal, a normal thickness of a steak. A portion size is too large, I, I think is what they're saying. So again, that comes down to your market, right? The way that we sell, we want pounds to sell. So frame is not a problem. Again, if your entire market is focused around farmer's markets, and if that's a problem, I do understand bringing, bringing frame size down some. I understand it's, it's because you're in a very different market. You're, you're selling direct to consumer. I want to... Oh, one more ahead. thing. Yep. Sorry, Becky. You know... One more thing I'll say, if, if, you're a, if you're a cattle operation and freezer beef sales, or I'm sorry, if farmer's markets are a small piece of your, your sales, right? Don't change everything that you do for a small share of your market, right? So, so make sure that if you're doing that, it's because that is the focus, the most important piece of, of your market, not just a sideline. Sorry, Becky. No, I just wanted to remind our attendees that we will continue to take questions in the Q&A box um, if you have some more. So, Kenny, the last one I have in here for you before we go back to Greg, um, it, it says, perhaps you mentioned this and I missed it, but most of these small to moderate cows will still wean a very marketable calf with the right bull. Sure. I think the point is, can I have can I have small to moderate frame gals and a bull that gives me some growth? And the answer is yes. And, you know, I, I didn't mention bulls, but you know, that's half of the problem, right? Or half of the solution. You know, I always say this. You also want to keep an eye on, on you know, on calving difficulty. So you want, you know, I, I think the concept of smaller frame cows and a bull that throws some growth is ideal. And just certainly, certainly keep easy calving in mind because that can be a problem. But I, I agree completely with the comment. Greg, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So I've got a, a few questions that we need that we have left from after your presentation. Um, the first two are about water sources. Uh, do you need a water source every few acres to be successful with bale grazing? And a really good question. And this is one of those things where if I'd had 30 more minutes to present, <laughs> that's a perfect thing to have include because it's important. Um, so the short answer is in the wintertime, you do not need nearly the, the number of water sources that you would in the summertime. So just as an example, the, the main farm that we have that we finish on, we have about 45 acres on that. And we really We've got a, a actual a third, you know, freeze-proof water source, but it's right in the very front that we rarely use. It's more used for bringing calves. We really only have two freeze-proof, you know, foolproof type water sources for for the bulk of the forty-five acres. Now we have learned to manage around that. As an example, one of those water sources serves three different paddocks um, pastures. We've also learned that you know cattle can walk a long ways in the wintertime if, if, if they need to. That doesn't mean that's ideal, but they can get by with that. Um, another thing that we've done is we, we do have quite a bit of above ground water piping. In, in other words, sources that work in the summertime, but, but don't you know when it starts freezing up. We will use those strategically in the fall. Just think about a typical fall, you will get a week at a time where, where the temperature may get down to maybe 30, but not enough where it's going to freeze that up. So in other words, we will hit those areas of the farm. We will bail graze those in late fall uh, during those time periods. 
and save those the, the really good winter water source that we have for the times that we know that that you know it's always going to be a danger of freezing. So my main point is you can you would be surprised at, at how little water that you need in the winter time to really get by if you're creative about it and willing to to be a little bit of uh, willing to be flexible. And then to follow up on that, uh, so bale grazing typically happens in the winter, and we all know what our water sources look like around them. They turn into, they can turn into mud holes. Can you discuss a little bit more about what, in your experience, what you've observed around the waters? I mean, my main comment is our water sources, if we if we compare them against a, a typical, you know, dry lot water source or a, a feeding pad, they, I will say in general, they look a lot better than those. That's all I, I can say. Are they ideal? No. Is there damage around them? Yes. Uh, but comparing it to, our, you know, most of our other alternatives, they're, they don't look quite as bad. Um, the key there is, is, you know, to have heavy use areas around those water sources when, when you build them, make sure that you you have a good um, you know skirt around those that ha, you know that has gravel and geotextile those sort of things but that said yeah you're still going to have damage leading to them somewhat and that's just part of every spring we do some reseeding in those areas so after the cows leave in the spring um, how do you manage around that where the hay rings were, do you um, harrow it or drag it to spread out the manure and smooth out some of the divots that are created? Uh -huh. And I talked a little bit about this during the presentation, but but the short answer is no, we, we don't harrow at all on the farm. Um, I get that question asked a lot and <clears throat> hmm, I'm trying to think the right way to, to maybe answer this, but there are some soils that, that just don't have a lot of biological activity in them. And, and those soils, you're not going to break down the hay residue as quickly. You're not going to break down the, the manure pats as quickly. Um, and without going into a lot of detail, that may be part of the problem. So some farms, just things do not break down like they do on, on ours. Um, one of the farms that's been bale grazing for three years, this is his third year in Anderson County, he made the comment that he he does not worm any of his mature cows. He he worms his um, you know the heifers when they come in. He'll worm his calves, but his his theory is because he's not worming the bulk of his herd. He is he is definitely seeing an increased amount of activity of his manure pat patties breaking down, particularly during the winter time. Uh, he said he's amazed that it by springtime, just within a few weeks, most it's hard for him to find any of those patties that, that carried over from the wintertime, say by late April, early May. And, and that's exactly our experience. We just, you, you will not find those on our farm after a few weeks in, into the springtime. But for some folks, they may need to do some harrow. We had another question around supplemental feeding. So if any of the farms that you've worked with uh, also fed grain while bale grazing, or do you just focus on the hay? None of the farms that I work with, I think, there, there may be one, the one that I started with this winter, he might do a little supplementation, but but not that I know. So for the most part, no, no knowing that I work with supplements with grain. Um, part of that, I think part of the key there is having a, a uh, at least some stockpile, like I showed you in those pictures. If you have a, at least a third of their diet with good stockpile, let's say is you know around 15% protein, that will that will do wonders in terms of improving the performance of those cows through the winter time. Um, the next two questions are around seeding after the fact, after the cows have left. So, what kind of seed do you hand sow around the spots where the hay rings were? And then to follow up with that specifically, would rye work for a stockpile in that area? Uh, and I'm not sure if I understand the very end of it, but I, I can tell you, um, so in general, you can, I will tell you what we do, but I, I will also say that there, you know, there are probably many ways you could skin that cat. Um, what I would encourage you is whatever you want long run in that pasture, definitely include that in that mix. So for us, that would be clovers, orchard grass, um, predominantly for, for things we want there in the long term. But again, I mentioned this, I think, in one of the slides. 
Um, not many people probably have ever used um, chicory or, or plantain, and those are improved forage varieties. You, you know, you probably can't get them at every farm store. You, they would probably have to order them. But they have a really deep tap root, a very strong tap root, and, and they essentially are very good at breaking through compaction that you will have in that impact zone where the hooves kind of are, are spent most of the time around that ring. So to, to us, that's key, those two species to, to help and I call those the pioneer species. They, they, they kind of, you'll see a lot of them the first year, kind of over time they die out and then your clovers and, and orchard grass kind of fill in. Um, I'd also say experiment. You know, one thing that we're gonna try this year that we never had before are oats. Oat, you know, I've, we have seeded oats before just as a, as a um, late winter, early spring forage. And I've been amazed how quickly it, it germinates and how quickly it grows. So it seems to me that that would work fairly well in those bale grazing areas. Again, kind of as a, a nurse crop. In other words, it's going to come on quick. It dies out, say, by early June and let everything else kind of come on. So definitely experiment. We, we also use a fair amount of Italian ryegrass. Um, again, that's kind of a pioneer species. It will, it will put on a lot of growth in spring uh, compared to, say, orchard grass, but it will, it will definitely just last one year here in Kentucky. I'm not sure if I understood the second part related to rye. Sure, it's, the question was phrased, would this work with a cover crop such as cereal rye? Oh, oh I think I Use as a stockpile also. Okay, so they just meant, could you bale graze, I think on, on something like a winter annual, like rye or maybe even winter wheat, that sort of thing. And the answer is yes, in, in fact, We've not done this. Um, we've tried. We just the new farm. The por the fertility is so poor that um, the rye that we plant in the fall, we just there's not enough there to graze in the winter time. It, it literally it, there's not enough there to graze until spring. Um, but our idea was if we had a, a decent you know growth of rye that by winter time we would we would bale graze in that you know, you'd have a very high quality not a lot but a, a really high quality. Uh, forage in the rye, and again, mixing that with the, with the bales, um, just like we talked about in the stockpile, but even better than the, the fescue stockpile, yeah, that would be a, a great combination. The, the thing that you want to look out for, and I'm assuming you're saying you would put rye in, in say, a crop field or something like that, uh, you just need to be very careful about not pugging that, particularly if, if it's, you know, your main crop is, say, corn, soybeans in the summertime. So if that was a situation I would encourage you to do it, but have an, an alternative source. So if it gets wet, you can take them out of that rye and put them on, say, you know, perennial pasture. And you can bale graze in that perennial pasture and wait till it dries up before you bring them back onto that rye, would be my advice. So as we've answered the questions, we use the word stockpile. And we've had a question come through that asked us to define what stockpile is. OK, yeah, fair enough. Um, so generally, when when most people talk about a stockpile, it would be essentially deferring some of your fall growth where you're not grazing that in the fall so that it carries through in, into, say, late fall or early winter so that you essentially can, can graze that during the wintertime when typically most people may not have any type of perennial pasture to, to graze. Um, so that that's what most people mean by, by stockpile. So in some of the pictures I showed you, related to bale grazing, there, there was some green grass. That's that's what I mean by stockpile. Um, so when bale grazing or unrolling hay, how do you control the grass height and main, and prevent overgrazing? Uh, the short answer is you can't. So if if they're if you're in their bale grazing or unrolling uh, and you have some, and again, I I encourage you, it's it's a good idea if you can to try to have stockpile in there with those. Uh, I've never tried it with unrolling, but I think that would work also, but I, I would want to experiment a little bit before I, I said that definitively. But yeah, you know, hopefully you do have some grass growth and the answer is, in, unless your hay is exceptionally good quality, they're typically going to graze, you know, what grass is left in that pasture pretty much to the ground before they clean up the hay. So the short answer is they will graze it, whatever is, is left there pretty severely. Um, and that isn't necessarily a problem. What you don't want to do is you, you don't want to have them keep access to say that. that and, and I mentioned something about having a few different pastures. In other words, don't just bale graze all winter on one pasture. 
Because if you do that, let's say you're on one big pasture, they have access to the whole thing for say 120 days and you bale graze very, um, at very high densities. Cattle are gonna go all around that, you know, that big pasture. And I promise you what they graze in the first week, though there will be some regrowth by the end of that 100 or 120 days. When the cattle graze at the second time, that's when you will set back that pasture for the springtime. So in other words, I don't know what the magic number is, but probably you, you don't want them having access to any one area for more than 30 days at a time, even in the wintertime. And, and once they bale graze, or if you enroll hay in that area, you don't want them coming back the entire winter, keep moving to different areas. If you come back to that same area and you get some regrowth, cattle will, will graze it down to the ground and that pasture will be delayed. And, and I've seen a, a farm that did that um, and their spring growth on that pasture was delayed by a month easily. So the last question we have um, in the chat box, it says good soil biological activity. As I think about this, do animals that play havoc under my barns, i.e. skunks, raccoons, et cetera, help with this component? I don't know that much about the skunks and the raccoons. Um, I, will, I, I will say raccoons can be one of the most vicious animals I know pound for pound. Uh, ones I've caught in, in live traps, but um, I don't think they're, I, I think the biological activity that's helping your farm the most are, are those, um, those critters that are in the soil. So you, your, uh, your microbes, your fungi, those, those the earthworms, uh, anthropods, all those things, that's what, when I say biological activity, that's what I generally mean your soil life and, and the, the more alive your soil is, the better your farm is gonna perform. The, the better the biological activity, the less fertilizer that you're gonna need, particularly nitrogen. Uh, there's some really good research coming out of North Carolina by Alan Franz Lubers that's, that's showing that definitively. Um, and, and that generally is tied with high organic matter. So the higher your organic matter, generally not 100%, but in general, the, the higher your biological activity is gonna be. Okay, that's all the questions we have right now. Uh, Kenny, I see you put it in the chat box, but can you repeat tonight's CAPE education code, please? I sure can. C-C-P-C-W-E-D. Yes, thank you. So with that, I'll wrap us up for tonight. We do appreciate you all joining, joining us again this evening. Uh, and the support to the Kentucky Agriculture Development Fund. Um, as a reminder, if you have not registered for session three tomorrow evening, there is a link in the chat box where you can click and register for that. We will be sending out a wrap up email at the conclusion of the series that includes the recordings of all three nights along with the PowerPoint slides that have been presented. Uh, we appreciate all of your time tonight and we thank you for joining us. Have a good evening.